Hi everyone and welcome to IDG Live. This is Robert and today we are talking about the Night's Watch. Uh, I was just looking at the chat just before I came in. Uh, a lot of people seem to be stuck in some very uh, cold and snowy climbs at the moment, which kind of fits the backdrop of what I've got going on. I hope you are staying warm if that is where you are. It's a little bit chilly here as well, hence the nice woolly jumper for, uh, for the stream today. Uh, but let's get into... Oh, actually... One other, just a little uh, bit of admin before we get going. Uh, apologies for the sound quality last time. Um, I think that my old microphone was dying. Um, I've got a different one this time. I hope that that is working well. Um, if you could let me know, I won't be able to spot all of the comments coming through, but after the stream, I would hugely appreciate it. If you could just let me know down in the comments um, below if it was any good. Um, otherwise, I'll just keep on trying different things until we get it right. So anyway, I hope that's all working for you, but let's talk about the Night's Watch. Um, this is sort of like an addendum to the uh, the series that we've been doing. We've been going through the, the major-ish houses of the North, not just House Stark, but all of the, the houses sort of bubbling underneath House Bolton, um, House Mormont, the interesting houses that perhaps we don't give um, all of the attention that we probably should do all of the time. Um, and uh, before we left the North, I thought it probably made sense just to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the Night's Watch, because it, obviously they're hugely important in uh, not just the story, but the, the, the whole history of how the North operates. So um, we're going to do that. Um, what I try to do to start with is a little bit of an overview of history. I thought the the big thing about the Night's Watch is um, a lot of that, they're obviously very old, but a lot of their history is just them doing their job. Um, and so we only sort of get a few like little bits here and there um, of where things went wrong. But I think the the overarching message that we have to take from the history of the Night's Watch is that it, for almost all of their history, and their history is thousands of years uh, long, for almost all of their history, um, the uh, they have been there doing what they are sworn to do, um, not causing a problem, not uh, rebelling, uh, just defending, as they see it, the realms of men against the others or latterly the wildlings. And the second sort of thing, which kind of brings me on to this, the second thing that I think we need to be understanding about the Night's Watch is that over time, their original purpose about defending against the others has been slowly subsumed. Once the others did not come back after 100 years, 1,000 years, several thousand years, and they've been kind of consigned to the world of legend, uh, after that, it really was the wildlings. And so most of the things that we hear about happening with the watch in relatively recent history is about them dealing with the wildlings. So um, I will start just a little bit about their founding. I've got a couple of questions about their founding, which we'll pick up on in a bit. But the first thing to say is that we, we for obvious reasons, we think of the Night's Watch as being synonymous with the wall. But if you go back to the earliest legends, the legends of the long night, uh, the first long night, uh, the legends of the last hero, you'll find them mentioned before the end of the long night, before the building of the wall. So the Night's Watch, or something that was later called the Night's Watch, we don't know all of the details, was around and they were involved in the fight against the others the first time around. Indeed, there's a song that they sing um, uh, in the books, actually, which seems to be passed down generation to generation, that is remembering the fact that uh, they, in the Battle for the Dawn, which was the decisive battle against the others, they, on horseback it would appear, charged against the others, and this was the decisive battle. We don't have a full battle breakdown. We don't know all of the details of this. The implication is that they discovered the last hero had gone off, talked to the children of the forest, found out about Dragonglass, brought that back information back to the Night's Watch. The Night's Watch then used Dragonglass, and this pushed the others back. It's something along those lines. George R. R. Martin tells us with all of these histories, ancient, ancient histories, 
we have to take them with a big pinch of salt. We shouldn't take everything we um, see uh, as, uh, or everything we read as um, exactly right. These are legends. Uh, Steve Ashley and Turner saying, uh, seems like when my head goes down, the sound drops out, otherwise it's fine. Well, in that case, I'll try moving this a little bit and see whether that works. Um, uh, so uh, thank you for the ongoing feedback on the um uh on on the um sound issues uh, so they they then played this important part in uh, the uh, the end of the long night and then when the wall was built that's when they became synonymous with the wall the night's watch were attached to the wall um they the and the wall we've said it before uh, seems to be initially primarily a magical defensive line with a wall kind of marking it. But then over years, centuries, millennia, the wall got built up and built up and built up until it is the height that it is today. So people look at it and see this as a physical barrier. But in reality, the main thing is not the physical barrier. You can go around it. There, You can climb over it. You can go under it. The physical barrier is not the huge issue. The huge issue the magical barrier that is there. Now, um, the Night's Watch built, uh, in total, 19 different forts or castles along the wall. They never had more than 17 uh, on the go at any one time. But the Night's Watch at its height was huge. This was a massive, massive um, uh, sort of organisation thousands, well more than 10,000, uh, perhaps tens of thousands. And it seems to have kept those numbers up throughout its history. We get, uh, we'll perhaps talk about it a little bit later, we get the incident um, with the Knight's King. Um, but uh, other than that, broadly speaking, for the next long time, the Knight's Watch did their duty and across Westeros, people would send them not just their criminals and their low lives, but people, nobles of high birth. When you go back to the uh, Lord's Commander that we get name checked going back through history, you find them coming from all over the Seven Kingdoms. There's a high tower there, there are some from the Iron Islands, uh, there's the Royces, as well as all of the Northerners. Um, this, is, uh, this is something that uh, a, a job that you would go to if, yes, if you wished to have all of your previous crimes um, sort of overlooked, passed over, if, if that was your option, be killed or to go to the wall, then maybe it, that's, you know, uh, that you would be given that option. Uh, but this was also a noble calling for third, fourth, fifth sons of noble lords. If there was no real chance for them uh, to be uh, inheriting, if there was no real chance of them even getting a decent marriage, they could head up to the wall. And at the wall, it was the closest that you could get for a very long time, I suspect, within Westeros to an egalitarian structure. Um, um, a, a chance of actually getting promoted on your own merits. This is something which is often overlooked, but they have one of the few quasi democracies anywhere in Westeros. Everyone gets to vote on who is going to be the next Lord Commander. This isn't just the, you know, the landed gentry get to vote. Uh, this is everyone. Everyone gets one vote. And what that has meant is that the person who becomes Lord Commander is not necessarily a, a lord, um, they obviously have several inbuilt advantages. They've they've been trained to to fight. They've been trained to lead. Then they've got great name recognition uh, and many other things. But if you are just a normal person, there is a chance for you. If you can show that you are particularly good at something, then you will be rewarded. You will be uh, promoted according to your own merits. Which in a very feudalistic society is actually quite a rare thing. So whereas we might think, oh, why on earth would anyone choose to go to the wall? To them at that time, actually, it, it had some advantages. 
and you would always be fed and you would all yes it would obviously be very cold but they you would have somewhere to some shelter um this was a place for people to build a good career for themselves um and the way that they were structured hasn't really changed huge amounts over time you get the lord commander who's in charge of everything um, that initially based at the Night Fort and then moved uh, more recently across to Castle Black. And then you get the three main branches of uh, the uh, uh, the Night's Watch. You get the Rangers. The Rangers specialize in going north of the wall, engaging with the wildlings, tracking everything that they're supposed to be doing uh, in terms of keeping an eye on what's going on north of the wall. Uh, the Stewards, who did all of the day-to-day -day admin, they were the, the people, not just we see the stewards, and Jon Snow was a steward, uh, and he was there sort of basically serving on Lord Mormont, but there were other stewards. There were all of the people who were helping out Maester Aemon were stewards. The stewards were also farmers. They were also the blacksmiths. They were the people keeping the whole thing going. Then you get to the builders. The builders would build the wall they would do the repairs in all of the different castles and forts up and down um they would also be making sure that um all of the infrastructure was working right the uh, the trebuchets and things on the top of the wall were working fine um, and then each fort would have its own commander and there would be outside of this structure you would have septons uh certainly latterly and maesters so it built up around itself this structure that worked and um, it was supported through the gift. Originally, this was the, the strip of land just south of the wall, which was known as Brandon's gift that got added onto um, under the Targaryens with the new gift when Queen Alison de Harris um, decided that they needed a little bit more land to support them. That land basically... Uh, some of it would be directly farmed and used by the Night's Watch when they had lots of people. Um, but particularly in the new gift, then all of the people who are already living there in their homesteads um, uh, and small towns and villages, they would basically be paying their ta taxes, either in coin or in goods and services, up to the Night's Watch rather than whoever they used to, probably House Umber. And uh, that, as well as other um, uh, donations that the Night's Watch received, kept them going. So, um, as I say, this is their story all the way through. It's just they always were like that. We get, and we'll come into why the decline. We've got some questions about that. Um, but uh, there was a long, slow decline um, which led up to the Targaryen invasion. But then after that, um, it really came down. We know that when the Targaryens invaded, there were 10,000 uh, members of the Night's Watch. We we know this because this was actually a concern and a consideration for Aegon, uh, because he there, there's an army, basically, right at the very top of this land that he wished to conquer, and he needed to be aware of it. Added to which, the Lord Commander at the time was the brother of uh, Harren, Black Harren, who was the guy, Harren the Black, who was the guy in Harrenhal who defied the Targaryens and Aegon basically burnt him and melted his castle. And so the concern was, would Harren's brother decide to bring the Night's Watch down south? He didn't. Um, but through this, we learn that there were 10,000 at the time. By the time of the story that we have, that's down to under a thousand. There is something like 600 in Castle Black, something like 200 in uh, the Shadow Tower, and something less than 100 at East Watch. And they are down to just those three. So Castle Black roughly in the middle, and then Shadow Tower right on the far west, and East Watch right on the far east. And as they've abandoned more castles, their ability to guard the wall has obviously come down. The wildling raids have increased because it is being um, less well protected and uh, that has affected the land in the gift 
This is why when Bran heads up, um, Bran and co head up, they come to Queen's Crown. Queen's Crown used to be a nice little village with a, a sort of a hold fast and a, a tower, fortified tower. That was all completely abandoned because of these endless wildling raids. Um, and so the gift is now largely uninhabited. By the time we get up to, as I say, the main story, then we've reached 997 Lord Commanders. This has been going on for a very, very long time. Okay. Um, uh, the uh, uh, let's have a quick look in the chat. I think that's all I'm going to say by way of an intro. I think most of us understand the Night's Watch very broadly, um, but that hopefully gets us all up to speed. What I'd like to focus in on today is the questions. Um, uh, I did have just before I uh, went live, Steve Ash Lerner Turner with another bad joke for the stream. Um, a whale walks into a bar, says, Yeah, you the barman says. Well, you should have ducked. Uh, again, I'll leave that one hanging. Uh, P.S. Mod Love and Push Your Merch. Well, I'm very happy to do some Mod life, uh, Love straight up early in this, uh, uh, the stream. The moderators are wonderful people and do an excellent job. Um, and Pushing My Merch, uh, I'm always terrible at that, but there should be a link down there somewhere. Um, it's good merch. I say that because I don't design it. Um, other people do. There's, you can still get that fantastic when in doubt, blame blood Raven, uh, t-shirt, uh, designed by the wonderful San Rixian. Um, if you're looking for that, that is still available. Uh, but let's go to, uh, some questions. Uh, Robbie, uh, OB, um, thank you very much saying hi, Robert. First time catching one of these lives. Well, welcome. Um, how do you think those in those in world view the stories of the knights? Uh, uh, I think the knights king um, and his mysterious wife. Also, if you have noise reduction running on your mic, turning that down could help. Uh, I don't know if I do have noise reduction. I'm not the most technical of people, but I will take that and I will go away and and, and uh, Google it and figure out whether I can or not. Uh, but thank you. Um, in terms of the, the Night's King, how do those in world view the stories? Well, as stories is the probably the short answer. In the North, these stories are still um, told in quite a widespread way. Um, they uh, in the South less so, um, but I don't think. And this is something that in Book One in George R. Martin, I think, does particularly well, is he tries to show us that the, the people that the world sees as wise and well-read and learned, those people dismiss any thought of the others, um, any thought of anything supernatural, really, and people like Tyrion, Maester Lewin. But they are wrong. Now, the fact that the Maesters have been teaching that the Night's Watcher uh, sorry, not the Night's Watch. The others are just a thing of myth and legend, and Tyrion clearly thinks it as well. I think we can probably safely assume um, that uh, this is uh, what the majority of people think, that these are just stories. Um, in the world of Ice and Fire, then you get um, a little bit of speculation about what might be the cause of these stories, and maybe the corpse queen, uh, she was just somebody from Barrowton, um, and that's why they called her that. Uh, maybe this there was a, a, a Lord Commander who seemed to, who wanted to um, create a little empire for himself. Certainly, there were a few others who did that. Um, in the nearly thousand others who followed, uh, so that's not unexpected. Um, so the Maesters just kind of try and explain it away in the in a way that actually nowadays we look at a lot of old myths and legends and academics these days would say, well, I'm sure this is based on a grain of truth somewhere. Um, that's the kind of feel that we've got going on there. So I don't think that anyone, this is thousands of years ago, I don't think anyone thinks that this is something that actually happened. Um, right, let's go to some questions from my patrons. Whitney 
saying, hi, Robert and Dan, please give him some ear scratches. Yes, I did give uh, Dan the door. He does like ear scratches. I gave him some earlier. Thank you. It is widely believed that the Night's Watch vowels were added onto at some point in its history. In your opinion, when was this change made and why? Well, we did, we talked about this very briefly last week, um, but let's pick up on this again. I'll read them out as they are, and then hopefully what you can see is that there is a shift in how the language feels. Night gathers, and now my watch begins. It shall not end until my death. I shall take no wife, hold no lands, father no children. I shall wear no crowns and win no glory. I shall live and die at my post. I am the sword in the darkness. I am the watcher on the walls. I am the fire that burns against the cold, the light that brings the dawn, the horn that wakes the sleepers, the shield that guards the realms of men. I pledge my life and honour to the night's watch for this night and all the nights to come. So when I talk about the language usage there, the... I, I hope what you picked up on is that you get sort of bracketing the middle bit. You get some very, um, uh, the language is a bit flowery, but it is, it's a series of promises about what you're going to do. I shall take no wife, hold no lands, father no children. I shall wear no crowns. I shall win no glory. I shall live and die at my post. I'll, I pledge my life on honor. These are oaths. These are promises. Um, but they are around the middle bit where the language is just very um, uh, visual. Um, and uh, it's there, it's saying, I am the sword in the darkness. I am the watcher on the walls. I am the fire that burns against the cold, the light that brings the dawn, the horn that wakes the sleepers, the shield that guards the realms of men. This is about what you are if you are a member of the Night's Watch. So um, the, the thinking is, and we, we don't have much evidence other than this kind of linguistic thing. Um, we will pick up on a bit more evidence a little bit later in the stream, incidentally. But because of the, this linguistic difference, the feeling is that that middle bit, that's probably the original oath, as it were, um, or description of what, what this is. And then around the outside of that was added these um, very clear promises on what this means, if you're going to join this order. Now, you're asking why the change might have been made um, and when. Uh, well, we've already said that the Night's Watch seemed to have been established before the end of the Long Night, before the establishment of the Wall. So. If you start to think about them as actually there, they are just people trying to protect humanity. Then you read that middle bit, not just thinking about these are people standing on a wall looking north, but these are people in the cold darkness, just sworn to be protecting humanity about what comes. Um, I am the sword in the darkness. I am the watcher on the walls. I am the fire that burns against the cold, the light that brings the dawn, the horn that wakes the sleepers, the shield that guards the realms of men. That's the feel that you get. These are the people who are there watching at night while everyone else is uh, getting some sleep, resting. They are the people who are standing on the walls of whatever, wherever they're hiding with a torch, uh, just holding out waiting for the dawn, protecting when needed. So that's that initial feel. And then when it becomes um, a structured organization and an order, that they feel that they need to actually promise certain things, rather than just having this kind of like um, uh, airy-fairy language about, oh, I am the watcher on the walls. That doesn't actually mean, that, that's not a promise. That's not, you're not locking people into a situation by that. So they have created these other things, these, these things that you promise. I shall take no wife. I shall hold no lands. I shall father no children. I shall wear no crowns. Now, it's possible lots of people have speculated, and I think this makes a lot of sense, is that these kinds of things could happen after one of the many uh, times that the Night's Watch did rebel. Um, now, uh, the... The idea, um, actually, we've, I've got a question 
um, sort of which comes on from what I'm just about to say, which I'll come on to in just one moment. Um, but uh, the idea is that the, those bits then were tagged on to what was already the already the kind of the catchphrases, the, the raison d'etre. This is the, the feel of what they are about. And then tagged on around the outside of that are actual promises, oaths that you have to make in order to be a member of that uh, martial order. So I said I've got another question. I've got another couple of questions, actually. The Runabir Mitra says, salutations from your new Patreon member. Welcome. Uh, if you do want to support this channel, Patreon is still the best way to do that. Uh, there's a link probably down in the description. Um, uh, so uh, the Night's Watch Oath, says Runabir, the Night's Watch Oath has a section distinctly different, i.e. the I am the something parts, which was what I was just talking about. Could you give your thoughts on the Watcher on the Walls piece? What walls are we talking about here, apart from the main wall? Um, old Stones and High Heart, where there was a grove of weirwood trees, High Tower or Storm's End. Um, so is it possible that this oath gives us the idea that Night's Watch was originally supposed to guard the realm from multiple touch points, and not just the main wall in the north? Hashtag GGMU, hashtag mod love. Yeah, absolutely on both of those. Um, and uh, I think by this point, you'll have caught up with me because the answer is yes. And I think this is the clue. This is the thing lots of people have picked up on the watcher on the walls. This is this is not the the wall that we're talking about here. This original and to say the original words of the oath, I don't think this is even an oath. I think this is just like a, um, a, a series of descriptions, flowery descriptions of what they are. The watcher on the walls is just, I am the person, if you imagine a walled uh, enclosure, I am the person watching out there. And that is the kind of feel. This is from before the end of the long night. And then the other stuff got tagged on around the outside. So yeah, maybe it's it counts as um, uh, that uh, this might have been. You've talked about the High Tower or Storm's End, both of which potentially could be uh, built around that time. Um, but I think it's just as likely that this is just normal places. These these are people who are uh, committed to protecting humanity in the long, long night. Um, okay, so uh, that was uh, a couple of thoughts about the uh, the Night's Watch Oath. Um, I had a question from uh, Vilma Cantor. I probably mispronounced that. Apologies. Saying, um, hi, Robert. How, uh, how do the men of the Night's Watch pay for their visits to the Molestown brothel? Do they earn a salary or do they use other means of payment? It's a really good question. Uh, so we're not really told this. Uh, George R. R. Martin doesn't um, explicitly uh, get into that. There, there's no hint that they get a salary per se, uh, but that doesn't mean that there isn't money. And uh, the, the way I would kind of, uh, sort of describe this is, um, the way a prison economy might work is that uh, some people might come in and and they may maybe they uh, somebody got some stuff smuggled in uh, maybe and and then they use I don't know cigarettes as a form of currency. Um, when you get to the the wall, if you get somebody coming in, uh, like Waymar Royce, for example who we saw in the prologue to book one. He arrives from a rich family, uh, and we can see he's got rich clothes, he's got nice furs, he's got a great sword. Um, he probably will have come with money, and that money will have entered the ecosystem of Castle Black, and people will have used it to be getting things from other people. So, whereas... It might, at one level, work as this kind of idealistic communist approach that you know everyone shares everything um, uh, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. In reality, clearly there was some form of 
currency going around that people could get hold of in some way, um, and then they could sort of barter for stuff. Uh, Mara Lee, hi there, Mara, great to see you, saying just a show of love and support. You're the best and loved. Well, thank you very much. Um, let's go to uh, J.O. saying, I know you're talking about the Night's Watch, uh, but who is your favourite Targaryen? Um, if, if you would, can you please give your top five and why? Well, as I'm talking about the Night's Watch, I will I will put as my top two, as I'll give you my top two as, as uh, Blood Raven and Maester Aemon, who both were members of the Night's Watch. I don't really do top fives um, or top tens. I don't, I'm not a big fan of ranking, I'm afraid. Um, but in terms of characters that I enjoy reading, about, I find um, uh, uh, some of the characters like Shira Seastar I find absolutely fascinating. I would love to know more about her as a character. Um, uh, someone like um, well, Aegon the First is really intriguing. I would have loved to know a little bit more about him. Um, uh, Rhaenyra and Damon as a couple, I think that whole dynamic really fascinating so the, um uh yeah i don't don't really do top fives in terms of how good someone is but in terms of just characters i find fascinating reading about i think those are those are some of them uh mr wombo saying so you're saying there's some sort of a watching party that happens at night yeah i mean very very high level that's what i'm talking about a username redacted saying was there any conflict between the small folk and the gift and the Night's Watch, particularly during periods of agricultural hardship, abuse, or the decline when taxes seemed uh, to not pay for protection. Yes, there, there definitely was. Um, so th there seems to have been a, a difference between the first gift, Brandon's gift, which had been there for thousands of years, and then the new gift, which was the one uh, given uh, by... Basically, it was Jaehaerys and Alison decided to, to give that extra bit of land. The top bit, um, this, uh, although, yes, there were some sort of uh, farmsteads and holdfasts and things like that, a lot of that was farmed by the Night's Watch themselves. Um, and that, that was established. Everybody understood um, uh, how that works if there were people who were uh, were there then they knew that they had to be paying their um their tithe up to the night's watch um in however that tithe whether that was in cash or whether that was in um goods or services um so everyone that that system seemed to work sort of okay with the new gift the extra bit that was added on it didn't work very well um, first of all, um, the um, House Umber, who were the top house up there, they didn't like this to start with because a large amount of their land was given away. And the Night's Watch by this point was starting to decline. And so they found it, although they happily would be taking stuff from there, they weren't farming any of this land. And they also weren't protecting it particularly well because they were in decline. They found it very hard to stop the wildlings from um, coming over or around or under the wall. Um, and what happened with the new gift was that people got annoyed because they were they were paying effectively, and in our way of understanding these things, they were paying their taxes now to the Night's Watch, and the Night's Watch were not doing their bit. They were not protecting them. House Umber would always be coming out to protect their people when they could. Uh, the Night's Watch, by that point, often didn't have the people to spare. And because it was actually quite a long way south of the wall, uh, by the time they'd heard that anything was going on and arrived, it was all a little bit too late. So, uh, the reason why that part of the country is now largely empty is partly because the wildlings came and attacked certain places, and partly because people just decided to move. Why Why on earth would they stay where they are if they're still paying taxes, but they're not actually getting any protection at the, against the wildlings? Uh, and so a lot of people moved even further south into Umber lands. Um, and uh, yeah, when you say conflict, 
it it is there was definitely conflict going on there. Um, Steve Ashlana Turner saying, thinking of Watcher on the Walls, I think originally no physical wall, just forts, hence walls plural. The wall was built to connect the forts over time. Is that possible? Well, one interesting thing I didn't actually mention, um, but when we look at Castle Black, say, on the TV show that has walls around it, the Night's Watch, uh, we call them castles or walls or things like that, that's the wrong word, really. Um, they're a set of buildings up against the wall. Uh, there is no, they, they never allowed a wall to be built to the south, um, partly because of a, uh, the Night's Watch themselves taking a point of principles. They, they have no enemies to the south. Their only enemies are to the north. But also partly um, because they weren't allowed to, because uh, that would then allow them to create a power base and actually be defendable. So the Starks and Whoever else to the south just said, no, you can't do that. You cannot build walls. You're not actually building castles. You're just building um, uh, basically towns, small towns up against the wall at certain places. I mean, they can be fortified, but there is no wall that's going around them. So, um, I, yeah, I like this idea that there's um, that the walls might be sort of around the forts, um, and then the wall slowly joined them. Um, that works quite well, although um, if, if certainly when you're heading east of Castle Black, you find the wall is basically a straight line, and the so the the forts are on that straight line. Uh, when you head west, it's more sort of like snake like. Um, but what that seems to imply is it's not just random forts placed somewhere in the, the north. This was forts placed next to the wall. So the wall came first, and then the forts came after that. The sole possible exception is the night fort, which possibly that was the, the center point where they decided, hey, this is where we're going to build the, the wall. But um, the, the night fort is a, a huge mystery. So I like the idea. My personal take, though, is the walls is not. So I think we need to forget the wall when we're talking about the watchers on or watcher on the walls. Uh, it's not the wall itself. It's just walls generally. Um, oh, Andrew K saying, I do think it's possible the night fort predated the wall, considering it's built around an epic magical super weirwood. Uh, yes, so uh, I, th I think I think we're probably on the same page on that one. Yeah, it's possible we don't know the exact founding of the Night Fort, but it is massive and it is ancient. Um, let's go to a question from Stephen: Was the Night's Watch already dwindling in the centuries or millennia before Aegon's conquest? Was it accelerated after the conquest? And if so, do we know why? Was it due to the Starks losing their sovereignty? Was it due more to the neglect of the Targaryens and the rest of the realm, leaving the wall as a glorified penal colony? Well, I think the answer to, is yes to most of that. So the wall, uh, so the, the Night's Watch had been declining. We have records, or the maesters say that they have seen records from the Night's Watch themselves that show that before the conquest, the, there was a slow decline in uh, people at the wall. Now, why? Why is that? Um, I mean, I think you you've suggested that Starks losing their, losing their sovereignty when the Targaryens come. Before that, though, I think it perhaps it's more that the Starks were being effective. If in the north, over time, the Starks weren't always in charge of the entire north. It took them millennia to be taking. All taking on all of the different various kings. We've been talking about that over the preceding weeks. Um, but once the Starks were in control of all of the north, then other than occasional Bolton uprisings, there weren't that many, or as many fights between all of these different kingdoms because there was peace. The Starks were doing a good job. So the north, yes, we've noted that the um, all of Westeros were sending 
uh, people up to the wall, but the North were sending the bulk of the numbers of people up to the wall uh, even then. And if there there were fewer opportunities for this, um, we, we see it so many times, like the the mass absolution at the end of a war of the, okay, well, I could either kill you or you go to the wall. Um, that didn't happen so much. And I think that that very slow decline was probably actually because of stark uh, good management of the North. And also this slow feeling that this isn't, the, the 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 reason that it was set up against the others that's no longer there so um those were the reasons why there was this slow decline before by the time we get to Aegon's invasion there were still 10,000 um uh, night's watchmen and they were in most if not all of the different forts at this point so this was um still a sizable force what caused its decline um, is a lot of things. The, there was, a again, a continued slow decline um, until just after the Dance of the Dragons. At the Dance of the Dragons, after the Dance of the Dragons, there were a series of wildling raids, um, including uh, on Queen's Gate, um, where the entire fort got completely overrun. And the the Night's Watch spent a huge amount of time and people uh, in pushing the wildlings back. Then also there was, around that time, there was a really, really harsh winter, really harsh, which meant that the, the Night's Watch lost a third of its force through that winter. So it came down, if it had been, at, I don't know, 9,000 at the start of that, then that immediately brought it down to 6,000. Then um, after that, we do start getting into um, the realms of uh, the, the Targaryens not really caring about uh, the wall. Um, we don't see it, at least. Uh, the, the visits up to the wall seem incredibly limited, um, and the quality of who gets sent up certainly starts to diminish. The same thing I was talking about with the Starks earlier about the less fighting between different factions, uh, different kings is also true. Uh, yes, we did see the there were some civil wars and the like, obviously under the Targaryens, which did lead to every now and then a group of people being sent up to the wall. But on the whole, they weren't. And um, that slow decline and then a big decline just after the dance of the dragons that just carried on um so from after the dance of the dragons it was whatever it was five six thousand that got down to about one thousand it was uh also the fact that in people's minds this shifted from being an honorable thing where people could go to you just send your criminals and the moment you turn it to you just send your criminals, then the the noble lords of the land aren't going to be sending their people up there unless it's like just the very northern uh, houses, the, the first men houses might still be, the Starks would still happily be sending people. Um, House Royce, as you saw, uh, Waymar Royce got sent up. He was uh, House Royce of a first men family as well. So some did still go up there. House Mormont, obviously very far north. They still saw this as a noble calling. Uh, but it's very noticeable when you're looking at the, the surnames of the uh, the command at the time of the uh, the start of the story. You you get a few knights. There's a hand, like half a dozen or so knights there at the wall. But... How many of the great and noble houses are represented? There's no high towers up there. Um, obviously, Maester Aemon is st still up there, but he's technically not House Targaryen. There are no Lannisters up there. There's no Arryns up there, or there's no Baratheons. There are no um, uh, ex-members of the um, uh, the Kingsguard. So this has slowly been the quality has slowly been coming down. As that came down, then people stopped sending their, their best. Um, 
Gabriel Farrell, uh, what's your read on John's time as Lord Commander? He gets assassinated by his own men, so I think we can agree he was far from perfect. But are there any obvious mistakes you think he made during his time that you would change? I've seen John get a lot of stick in the fandom, but given his goal of defeating the others, what else could he have done but let the wildlings in, etc.? Um, yeah, this is a, a really interesting one. So John is not um, Lord Commander of the Night's Watch for a very long time. And we do get to see from his POV what's going on. And the first thing you have to say is during this time, this is one of the hardest moments for a Lord Commander of the Night's Watch to take over. Um, he has been dealt a bad hand. So we have to, I think, interpret everything that he's he achieves or or does not achieve through the lens of this is a really tough job. Uh, and what I mean by that is the Night's Watch, if it had a thousand people before uh, the uh, the start of the books, then this was down, I don't know, maybe half that number now, um, added to which they just fought a battle against uh, the wildlings, many of whom are still north of the wall trying to get through. Um, Stannis has arrived with an army and taken up a residence at Castle Black uh, and demanding that he be recognised as king. Um, John also has uh, some of the most senior uh, members of the Night's Watch are absolutely 100% against him. Uh, so he's not got an easy job to start with. I think that's the first thing we have to recognise there. Um, and in terms of what uh, what he achieved, just very quickly, a few highlights I just noted down. Uh, so he makes a decision early on with uh, that he he wants to save the life of um, uh, this the baby, um, Mance Raider's baby. He does the baby swap um, uh, uh, and gets Sam and Maester Eamon headed off down to. Old Town, because he thinks that they're going to need some. He need they need to hear what's going on, and he needs Sam to get trained. That's long-term thinking on his part. He managed to deal with Stannis, um, uh, managed to get him out basically, um, and do it in such a way that he was uh, respecting him without ever saying, "I am taking your side in this war." Clearly, Cersei what was happening but that but uh john did manage to make it very clear to stannis saying no to stannis quite a lot um uh, stannis just for example stannis said uh i, I i'm gonna claim the gift um and i'm gonna have that as my lands and john just said nope that's ours and that actually took quite a lot to stand up to stannis at that point um, what else did he do? He obviously decided to let the wildlings through, or some of the wildlings through. Um, Janos Slint opposed him, and he executed him. Um, he made the decision that uh, just having three forts operational wasn't going to work, and so he sent his own allies, uh, people like Pip and Gren and the like, uh, Ed, off to these other forts uh, to get them back up and running. Um, he decided to gift the night fort to Stannis so that Stannis had a base and that would also be defended. Um, he, I, in my mind, in a really bad situation, if you're trying to interpret this in terms of um, managing to do the best in, in uh, facing up to the threat of the others about to come, what did he have to do? He had to uh, make sure that the forts and the defence of the um, uh, the the wall was fully manned and as good and strong as it could possibly be. Um, he started to think about how do I get people through the long night. He deals with Tycho Nostoris, gets himself a, a loan deal, thinking we've not got enough provisions here to get us through. Let's try and sort that out. He does a huge amount of thinking. And also, let's not forget, um, uh, the battle under the wall, the wildlings were attacking 
he actually did a really good job. He was basically, he was given command before he became Lord Commander. He was given command of the wall and he successfully defended it until the point where Stannis unexpectedly arrives. So for the most part, I think in very trying circumstances, he actually did a pretty good job. Um, I don't think there was a really good and positive way to get through all of that that makes the, all things perfect. Um, the only thing, the only really big black mark is actually what happened at the end when he gets he gets assassinated. Um, he gets assassinated, and, and we always view this because we see everything from his POV. Um, uh, and the show, the TV show, obviously made him uh, quite the heroic figure. Um, we always see this as being here's some people who turned on him, and they're the bad guys. From their perspective, what happened was that this is a person who was sworn to defend the wall against the wildlings, among others, has let a whole load of wildlings in, has um, then got uh, a letter from um, basically uh, Winterfell, his old life that he's supposed to have completely left behind, which gets him so angry and riled up. He says, right, that's it. I'm abandoning the wall. But do not forget, John's basically his last act was to abandon the wall and say, um, I'm not going to order any of you guys to follow me, but I would like you to. And so from the perspective of the the, the people who did kill John, he's actually abandoned his post and they are doing their job. They are fulfilling their vows as Night's Watchmen in stopping this Lord Commander who has abandoned his own vows. Uh, so... I think John could have, at the very least, handled that a lot better. Um, that was not something he allowed. He's got an anger management problem. We know this about John. Uh, but he could have done that a lot better. But in the build-up to that, I think it's hard to argue that he did a terrible job. He, he did a good job in trying circumstances. Um, Kaius Ballerina saying, just got back from the vet. Uh, cancer one and my cat Clara is finally done. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, here's a donation for food and toys and pampering in her honor for Dan the dog. May he be with you for many more years. Oh, well, that's incredibly kind. Thank you. Um, I'm really sorry if your, your cat Clara died. Um, I, yeah. My heart goes out to you. Um, I, that, that must be horrible, but. Uh, thank you so much for for that. I will uh, I will buy him a nice um, a nice treat of a chew thing. I think he does like. Uh, he's got a soft spot for pig's ears, um, which is not very pleasant to look at, but he does enjoy it. Uh, so thank you. Um, let's go to a question from uh, Diego Godoy saying, "Hola, Robert. Hola. Other than Bloodraven and Aemon." Do we know of other Targaryens that have joined the Night's Watch? The answer is uh, no, or the bigger answer is there are four Targaryens that have gone to the Wall. Um, the two we know about, Blood Raven and Maester Aemon. Um, then Aegor Rivers, who uh, lost the Blackfire Rebellion, um, and uh, the third Blackfire Rebellion, this one is, he lost a lot of Blackfire Rebellions, um, uh, and then gets got sent up to the wall, agreed to go to the wall, but escaped on his way up on the boat. Um, so he was sent up there, but he never arrived. He never actually joined the Night's Watch. And the final one, obviously, is John. Um, uh, as we are our working assumption, uh, Rhaegar and Lyanna's son. So uh, four have been sent up there, but the two key ones, um, obviously being Bloodraven and Maester Aemon. Uh, Mara Lee uh, saying, Hi Robert, once John is revived, besides seeking justice for his murder, what do you think he will do in the next chapter of his life? Do you think he will stay with the Night's Watch, join Stannis Baratheon's army? Will it be similar to what he did on the TV show? Uh, well, this is a really good question. Um, my... I think there's two elements to this. The, the the first is to say that there's no reason to 
think, based on what we know about people uh, dying and coming back, however it's done, I've spoken many times on how I think this will work, which is slightly different to the other thing at times that we've seen this. Uh, but there's no reason to think that his basic drives as a person will change. We certainly didn't see that with uh, Lady Stoneheart. Her um, need for revenge, this is about her family. She is there seeking revenge, trying to find her family. These are her drives which were there from uh, beforehand and are still there when she's Lady Stoneheart. The same with Beric Dondarrion. He, his same drives, he, doesn't, he loses a huge amount of memories uh, and a lot of the whys and wherefores, but his drive, core drives are the same. So I think what there's no reason to think that John's core drives are going to be any different afterwards. And he was absolutely focused on heading down to Winterfell. Um, he got riled up by the pink letter and he <clears throat> uh, he will head down there and he will probably run into in some way. He knows that Stannis is there already or Stannis is heading that way uh, and he will combine with the army that Stannis has pulled together, which is no longer just Stannis's army, let's not forget. He has been picking up people as he has been going. He's going through the northern mountain clans. He's gone through Deepwood Mott. So the Glovers and a lot of the uh, the, the houses um, in the Wolfswood have all come and joined up with him. Plus, there's a whole load of houses in Winterfell who are not as loyal to the Boltons as they are pretending. So I think he will definitely join up with all of that. And we will end up with um, him uh, being part of the the team that uh, kicks the Boltons out of Winterfell. That seems to be the logical uh, route that we've got gone, going down. But the, the other element to this is that the way that we think, our working assumption about how this is going to work, is that he's going to survive by his spirit, soul, whatever it is, going into his direwolf, ghost. If that happens, and then he comes back, back uh, what we've been told george R. martin specifically gave us a prologue um with varamir six skins teaching us a lot about how this walking thing works uh, what we've been told is that over time his um when he's with inside his wolf he will become more wolfish and so when he returns back to his own body part of that his character will be more wolfish. And now this is the thing I, I often say this, and it leads to these to people kind of speculating. What, what does that mean? Uh, does this mean that he's going to be more moody and broody? Quite possibly uh, more of a killer instinct, definitely more of a sort of a loner, uh, but also the pack mentality. So there's a kind of a dichotomy going on there. Um, it's not just wolfish generally, but also like his, like ghost, his direwolf. And what do we know about ghost? Well, ghost is obviously quiet. Um, um, and might we therefore, and, and a lot more kind of sneaky, it has to be said, might we therefore expect John to add that into his character to actually talk less? Um, it's, it's entirely possible. So um, you put all of these things together, is, is he going to do roughly what he did on the show? Well, I mean, I think the starting points along those lines, I think he is going to follow through with what he was wanting to do before he got stabbed, uh, which was head south to Winterfell. So I think that is definitely happening. Um, and once he's done that, I think, yes, the focus will be the others. How do we defeat the, uh, the army of the dead? So uh, that sort of broad arc, I think, is definitely going to be. Uh, Man of War saying, um, and this is your first super chat, so thank you. Um, uh, saying, hi, Robert, love your content. Thank you very much. What if we are thinking wrong? And Blood Raven is just a puppet of the children trying to stir up a war between the others and men to wipe both out. Also, thoughts on John's real name being uh, Visanus. Okay, let's take the first bit first. Um, is Blood Raven just a puppet of the children trying to stir up a war between the others and men to wipe both out? Well, I think there's certainly an argument that 
Uh, Blood Raven is a, I mean, I think a puppet is probably the wrong way of saying it, but he is now fully hooked up within the Weirwood network and uh, his plans are now aligned with theirs. I think that's probably the way I would say that. Um, do therefore the children of the forest want to fight between the others and humans? Um, well, this might have been, I'm not going to go all the way down the realms of speculation about the start of the others, but this might have been perhaps their initial plan. But everything that we've seen since then seems to imply that um, actually the children of the forest are wanting to help humans against the others, not the other way around. Uh, the, the children of the forest apparently supplied Dragonglass to the Night's Watch every year, a um, hundred Dragonglass daggers every year. And what we've seen with uh, Blood Raven is, particularly if you buy into this idea that he has been walking into Ghost a lot of this time, is you'll see that he has been giving the Night's Watch Dragon glass, the Horn of Winter. He's been um, ex showing them how to kill um, the Whites. Um, he's basically been giving them the advantage they need in order to be defeating the others. So I think that seems to be the side that they're on. In terms of John's name, um, you said, uh, could John's real name be Visanus? Now, I, I assume the reason you're thinking this is because um, we, uh, Rhaegar, the thinking that this John is Rhaegar's third child, Rhaegar had two children and he named them uh, Aegon and Rhaenys. And the idea, therefore, is that he is trying to, there must be three heads to the dragon. He is trying to create the third head of the dragon, which is Visenya. Um, uh, that's the original three Targaryens who uh, invaded. And John obviously turned out to be a boy, not a girl, and so they might not have called him Visenya. They might have called him uh, something else. And you suggest Vicinis. Um, now, other people have suggested Viserys. Visenya is generally considered to be the female version of Viserys, um, or Viserys, the male version of Visenya. I'm not sure which way around it goes. Um, but uh, my take. Uh, is that, yes, I 100% agree that um, what his plan was, what Rhaegar's plan was, was to have a third child, for that child to be um, female, and him to name that child Visenya, to create that um, three heads of the dragon. Um, however, he probably then left. He was the kind of person who believed absolutely in things. Um, uh, he, the, the few things of his that we say is that, um, that, that we hear him say, he's, he's very absolute. I am going to war. When I return, this is going to happen. Um, uh, I, there, there must be, there must be a third head. There must be a third child. Um, it's, he's very clear in his mind about all this. He's wrong about a lot of stuff. But he's very clear in his mind about it. So he will have left the Tower of Joy. He was not there for John's birth. Um, he will have left the Tower of Joy and said, uh, so this is going to be a girl and you're going to call her Visenya. He was not there when this child was named. Uh, he was dead by then. And both of his other children had also been killed. So actually what we need to, and then it turns out that you can't name this child in the way that he wanted anyway, because you can't call it, Visenya. Uh, so um, you then have to put yourself in the mind of uh, the person who will have named that baby, um, who is Liana. Now, what does Liana do? Does she name this baby Viserys? Um, uh, so Viserys, as you suggest, is possible. I, I, that's not the usual, as I say, it's not the usual male, male form of Viserys, so she might have, uh, of uh, Visenya, she might have thought of Viserys, but then uh, she will have been very aware that the new king, from the Targaryen perspective, was called Viserys. Daenerys' older brother, Viserys, was 
he was born. He was a young boy at the time. Uh, he was about six, I think. Would she want to give him the same name as uh, the somebody else in the family? Uh, perhaps not. Uh, so this is why I think Aegon is possible. Um, we don't know. Fundamentally, I don't think it makes huge amounts of difference to the story. Um, uh, I think so. I think Aegon is possible because she might have not wanted to name the baby Vagar because that was just too close to the bone to her. But she did want to honor his memory in some way. So perhaps she would name it after the uh, the baby who had died. Um, okay, uh, that I think that's me caught up in the chat. Um, yeah, that's me caught up in the chat. Let's go to um, a question from Sebastian Jumala saying, Hi, Robert. I hope you are well. I am. Thank you. Uh, the Night's Watch has existed for thousands of years, being constantly replenished with recruits after each conflict in Westeros as people chose the wall over execution. With the seven kingdoms united into one, this process should only get easier. Why do we see a decline in the numbers of the Night's Watch when the Targaryens take over? Oh, I've actually, sorry, I've, uh, Sebastian, I've sort of answered this one a little bit earlier, um, uh, so I won't go over, back over all of that. Um, uh, again, uh, hopefully you can flick back a little bit if you need that one. But you also asked... Um, the Night's Watch and the entire North is often faced with famines, and we hear about this many times in the books. It seems impossible to me that, that such a huge institution with so many castles could have survived for thousands of years with only Brandon's gift as a source of food and income, even if it was once more populated. Um, if it, even if it was once more populated. There are only three castles manned, and they are already struggling. So how did they manage to survive when there were 17 castles occupied at one point? Okay, um, this is the kind of question I love, <laughs> um, uh, the, the logistics and the economics of how these things worked. Uh, so the, when they had more people, they also had enough people, the, uh, the stewards could be farmers, um, and they could actually be in that land in the gift, which is actually quite a big bit of land. Um, they could produce a reasonably large amount of food. Added to which, um, they also got gifts from the big northern houses. Uh, so th this wasn't just they looked after themselves. Uh, every now and then the Starks would send them a little bit of something. The Umbers would, the Mormonts would. Um, the northern houses would, when they had a little bit of spare, they would help out. Um, you wonder whether that might still be too little and i think the answer is sometimes it probably was uh, we mentioned the uh, it's very harsh but we mentioned after the dance of the dragons in the year i can't remember what it was 134 or something like that there was a really really harsh winter and a third of the night's watch died uh, so that's that's what we're looking at here is that um Back when they had lots of people, they could farm the land properly. Um, also, they were receiving gifts from the main houses. But even so, sometimes a lot of Night's Watch did die. And from their perspective, probably a lot of the wildlings will have died as well. This was just, and a lot of the other people in the North would have died. This was just a part of life in the North. It was grim. It was hard. Um, yes, some... Sometimes it wasn't enough. Um, and why does the entire Night's Watch have so few maesters? Why didn't Lord Commander uh, Mormont send for at least one new maester? He obviously knew how old Maester Eamon was, and it's common practice to send for a new young maester when your current one is old, like with Cresson and Pylos on the Dragonstone. It was John, after Maester Eamon left, who considered doing it. And the path from Old Town to the Wall is excruciatingly long, meaning there isn't a single person with the knowledge of healing diseases and wounds or handling raven communication. And that should uh, paralyze such an institution for a very long time. Marley, I know you're also asking about the uh, maesters. So there are... 
at the start of the story, there are three maesters at the war, actually. There's uh, Maester Eamon is the main maester um, in Castle Black, but there's also a maester um, at the Shadow Tower, and there's a maester at Eastwatch. Now, neither of them appear to be particularly good at their job. Um, uh, I've forgotten the names off the top of my head, but the, the one at the Shadow Tower is... Um, more of a fighter than a maester, we're told, and the one uh, at Eastwatch um, likes his wine. Uh, so both of them can sort of do the basic maester things. They, If they are a maester, they have learnt that stuff. Um, it's just that they're not particularly good. The The assumption I think we often make is that uh, Jael Mamont did not ask or a replacement for Maester Eamon. I don't think we should necessarily think that that's true. What we know, or what we've heard from uh, other Maesters, um, Archmaester Marwyn, in this case, is that basically they wanted Eamon to be rotting at the wall. Um, would they, they, they were happy he went up there and they just want to forget about him. Um, because he's a Targaryen, he's connected with the dragons, he has dragon dreams, he believes in prophecy. Now, would the Citadel want to be sending up a new, young, impressionable maester to go and train for the last few years of his life under Maester Aemon? I think, I think my instinct is no. I think that may well be that J.O. Mormont said, could you please send us up a maester? Um, and they said, well, when your maester finally dies, we'll send you up a new one. Um, and that's fine. It might be that they just didn't have enough money because maesters don't come free. <laughs> that This is the, the deal, is that the whoever has the maester, they basically pay. They, they, they pay some money down to the Citadel. We don't know all of the details and of this, but you have to pay. You can't just have a maester for free. Um, and the Night's Watch didn't have huge amounts of money. So um, it's all of this is kind of understandable. Um, but the, uh, the, the mace, they do have two maesters up there still. And um, they, you would hope that they would therefore get another one uh, sent up. This is, this is going to be the fascinating thing what happens sam training up is a good idea obviously but that's a long-term idea um would they send someone up straight away it's possible um darius hutchinson uh, will the north claim parts of the land of always winter post the wall falling also what is the future of hard home or the fist of the first men would they be rebuilt okay so this is i, I assume you're talking uh long term after after the threat of the others has been dealt with, however it is dealt with, um, might, and let's say the wall is no longer there, it has come down or been demolished in some way, um, might the North go and claim parts of uh, beyond the wall? Um, so, I mean, I guess they could, uh, but my kind of instinct is that after what whatever happens at the end of this story i think people are just going to be in survival mode for a while i think most people will just be let's just have a few years and just let's just live they will be rebuilding their own lands their own places um might people head up north yes but the wall is a natural even if it's no longer there as a barrier, it's it's a natural border, uh, north of which people can say, well, we're not a part of the Seven Kingdoms. We're not a part of the, the north, so to speak. We are free folk. So um, would any of the places to the north get rebuilt? Well, potentially, but I don't think that that's the first order of business. Incidentally, this is... Um, uh, one of the spin-offs that we've been told are 
in development. I think it's sort of on the back burner. We haven't heard anything official about it for a while anyway. Uh, the Jon Snow show. Um, people were, and I was wondering, well, where are they going with this? Um, but if, say, John and Tormund and whoever else in the books heads north afterwards, what are they going to do? Well, rebuild. Uh, so might they go back to somewhere like Hard Home? It's entirely possible. Uh, a, you'd want somewhere near water. That would, that's a natural port at Hard Home. So perhaps you would go there. Fist of the First Men does seem a very long way north to go if you're just starting out again. Um, but yeah, it would offer a potentially decent. Um, if you remember the fist. It's called the fist of the first men because it's it's shaped like a fist coming up uh, out of the ground. It's this this hill with a flat top uh, that had um, these fortifications, ancient fortifications on. So it would make a good base. Um, so potentially either of them, yes. Uh, but I, I don't think we're going to be shown this. Um, let's go to. Um, the King's Road saying, G'day, Robert. G'day to you. Uh, are there any interesting historical Night's Watchman stories mentioned in the World Book or a current story? Uh, most have heard of the Night's King. However, I'm interested in perhaps lesser known stories. Um, an example might be something akin to how Corin Halfhand was able to survive an entire winter beyond the wall. Um, so there are lots of stories uh, that some of which I'll be sort of arch telling i guess through this stream um but one which we don't hear huge amounts about but um and is quite grisly uh, but this is a tale that we hear of the night's watch is of uh, the 79 sentinels the 79 sentinels um is about some night's watchmen who decided to um quit basically uh they escaped to the south and they thought they don't want to be night's watchmen anymore and uh their leader was this guy who was the youngest son of lord as well if you remember they're in the north next to house dustin and so they headed down there and they thought uh okay if we escape and we head down to this family member, he will look after us. But he didn't. He arrested them, and he got them all shipped back up to uh, the wall. At the wall, the decision was made to make an example of these 79 who refused to do their job, which was to act as the watchers on the wall. And so it was decided, and here comes the gruesome part, that they would be forced to watch from the wall forever. And holes were chipped and chiseled out in the ice wall. And one by one, they were placed into these holes, uh, staring northwards out uh, while they iced up in front of them. And near his death, this uh, Lord as well finally decided that he wanted to head north and he joined the night's watch pretty much as his last act so that he could spend eternity watching the north with his son who he had condemned to die so horribly uh, that's the story of the 79 sentinels it's it gets mentioned a couple of times um in the in the uh, the books it's one of the many grisly tales surrounding the night fort um let's go to Ranabir Mitra. Is it possible that the last hero and the Night's King were the same person? It could be possible that the way he stopped the original Long Night was by brokering a deal with the others, which involved rev regular sacrifices to them with the help of the Corpse Queen. Um, also, your old video on the Winterfell Crips talks about Brandon the Breaker Stark, who could have stopped this deal by eliminating both the Night's King who could have been incorrectly remembered as the last hero and his corpse queen and erasing their names from history. What do you uh, 
think about that. And just as an additional thing, uh, Randabir adds in, isn't it uncanny that the last hero travelled with a band of 12? The Knight's King was the 13th Lord Commander. Um, could the original Night's Watch have been the last hero's crew? Okay, um, an interesting theory. Um, my instinct is no, uh, but just first of all on that last bit with the numbers, uh, George R. R. Martin does, he likes using um, kind of evocative numbers. Um, and the 13th uh, Lord Commander, um, 13 is always almost universally seen as an unlucky number. Um, uh, and Judas, for example, in, in Christian Easter story is the the thirteenth person at the Last Supper, um, and he was the one who betrayed Jesus. Um, even if you go to the Hobbit, if you read the Hobbit, the starting point of the Hobbit is that the there were twelve dwarves plus Gandalf, and that made thirteen of them. And they didn't want to travel with thirteen because that was an unlucky number, so they had to find a fourteenth person. And this is where Bilbo comes into the equation. So, uh, using the thirteenth, this is George R. R. Martin being quite evocative. Uh, Twelve is um, uh, and the the last hero in the stories of the last hero. Uh, he heads off um, to try and end the long night, search for the children of the forest with twelve companions, and this. It, again, is evocative of the same kinds of things I've been talking about before. Jesus had 12 disciples. Um, this is a good and holy number. Um, so that's what I think George R. R. Martin was doing with those uh, numbers there. Um, the Could the last here in the Night's King be the same thing? Um, my, my instinct is no. Um, uh, the 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 legends, and we shouldn't place too much um, emphasis on legends being literally true, but the legends which surround that are about the wall, um, the the knight's king, or the person who was to become the knight's king, gazed out off of the wall northwards. Um, there was the king beyond the wall, implying the wall's existence. Um, there's the the blowing of the horn of Jordan, um, uh, and uh, all you know the rumours about what happens when you blow the horn of Jordan. Um, this this all uh, and the fact that this was a a betrayal in some way, um, the thirteenth Lord Commander betraying his vows. All of this seems to imply something which happened after the long night, after the creation of the wall. So I don't think so. I like the thinking. I always like having my assumptions about these kinds of things challenged. Um, but I, I think the balance of what we've got seems to imply that this was an event which happened after the, um, uh, the building of the wall. Um, uh, Derry's read it before, saying 12 plus 1 equals a baker's dozen. 12 is the standard, but plus 1 is special. Hobbits, dwarves are standard. Gandalf is special. 12 companions standard. Last hero, special. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that's uh, helpful. Darius Hutchinson saying, by the end, which characters will join the Night's Watch? I think the question is whether the Night's Watch is going to be needed. Or maybe I'll touch on this more towards the end of the stream, but um, the purpose of the Night's Watch is to be guarding the wall against the potential threat of the others. At the end of this story, if the others have gone, if their threat has been dealt with, do we need the wall? Do we need the Night's Watch? It's uh, it's an interesting question um, because there's lots of characters who their arcs might work well to end up at the wall. So, for example, um, Joram Mormont, um, he, his father, his, his dying wish, which he said to Sam, his dying wish was that his son Jorah should 
join the Night's Watch, have all of his old crime sins uh, washed away, and he could serve in the Night's Watch. That was his dying wish. And it would work well, you'd have to say, if um, if he does join at sort of the end of all of this and abandoning women have been his downfall, it, it would appear, um, and uh, making, you know, swearing to have no wife and father no children and things like that um, would work quite well. Added to which it would add another potential twist that Lord Mormont has passed uh, Longclaw, the ancestral Mormont sword, obviously down to John, but uh, John could very easily see this as a way to pass this on to uh, to Jorah. Um, maybe John gets another sword. That's, that's an entirely different uh, train of thought. But if John got another sword, he might be looking to see who should he be giving Longclaw to. And Jorah at the wall, perhaps as a Lord Commander, um, and this gets passed down then as the Lord Commander's sword. That that has a kind of a nice dramatic rounding off to it. Uh, but yeah, the question is, do we need the Night's Watch at the end of this story? Uh, let's go to a question from uh, Jay saying, Hey, Robert, uh, I would personally love a chronicle of the kings beyond the wall and their battles with the watch. Would you talk about some of the other ones that are mentioned other than Lance Raider? Yeah, I'll, I'll happily talk about a few of them. We don't get, it has to be said, we don't get great histories of them. The, the, the wildlings don't seem, I mean, they have an oral history, um, but the histories that we get are from the maesters. So these characters just kind of like appear for a bit and then disappear. But a few of the ones that we're talking, we've already mentioned Joraman, the king beyond the wall. Um, he was there with Brandon the Breaker, Brandon Stark. They jointly defeated the Night's King. Now, we're not told exactly what it is. He did blow the Horn of Winter, we're told, um, and giants rose from the earth, uh, and that's his role. Um, uh, now, <coughs> this is always fascinating when there are times that the, um, that the Starks and the King Beyond the Wall they're on the same side. It seems quite rare, but this is an echo that something that John is sort of echoing a lot later is that uh, you would expect the wildlings and the Starks, for example, to be at loggerheads and enemies, but they come together when they find the common threat, which is the others. So that's uh, that's one. Um, we've got Gendel and Gorn. Gendel and Gorn were brothers. Um, who were joint kings beyond the wall, they um, managed to get south of the wall, leading a whole army south of the wall, um, under the wall. They found tunnels under the wall. John uh, talks to Igreet about this, and they, they wonder about you know when they find that cave, and they have their nice snuggling time in their cave, uh, that uh, what, what if they carried on and they stumbled into the the tunnels, the caves that Gendel and Gorn found. Now, Gendel and Gorn got to the south with their army. They had a battle, um, and depending on whose side of this you listen to, either the heroic Starks and uh, others uh, pushed them back into the tunnels from whence they came, or uh, they decided to head back anyway. Um, either way, they got lost in the tunnels on their way back, and Maybe they're even still there, wandering around, trying to find their way out. Then we have uh, Bale the Bard. Um, this is a character who disguised himself as a bard, uh, went to Winterfell. He uh, wooed uh, the daughter of the Stark Lord King of Winter, um, and abducted her, ran off with her, left just a flower there on her bed. Uh, they went down into the Stark crypts, uh, were there for long enough for her to emerge with a child, his child, 
He, however, headed off back up north of the wall. Um, that child eventually became the the king of winter, the Lord Stark. Um, Bale the Bard eventually became the um, the king beyond the wall, and eventually he was killed by his own child. A tragedy. Um, so those are the sort of the three biggest stories that we have. We've also got um, Raymond Redbeard, which is probably the most recent uh, King Beyond the Wall. Uh, so it's not quite living memory when, when we're in, in the story. It might be for some of the very old characters. But he led a group of um, wildlings south of the Wall. Um, the Umbers and the Starks fought them at the Battle of the Long Lake. Um, and uh, Raymond Redbeard was, he managed to kill um, uh, the Lord Stark, but he himself was killed by the wonderfully named um, Artos the Implacable, um, who was the king's, who was the Stark's brother. Uh, why is this important? Other than the fact that he's got a fantastic name and should be remembered for that alone. But he was... He, he was so loved and respected that he got a statue in Winterfell crypts. Now, normally it was just the Lord uh, of the Starks who would get, or the King who would get a statue in the crypts of Winterfell, but he did. Um, and this was the precedent that Ned Stark could use when he decided that his brother and sister, Brandon and Lyanna should also get statues down there. Uh, so, it's not if you ever hear that you know the Brandon and Leanna were the only ones to get statues, uh, and why is that? What was Ned doing? Uh, you know, breaking all historical precedent. There was a historical precedent that he was using, which is Artos the Implacable. Um, username redacted. Are there any legendary members of the Night's Watch remembered or spoken about in the way Barristan Selmy is in the South? Um, no, is the short uh, answer. The, there, there are some great names of people who have been Blood Ravens, a clear example. Um, but the the whole point about the wall is that you don't you don't win. You never really win. You might successfully defend the wall. Uh, many, many of the Lord's Commanders did manage to do that. But you, you're you not there claiming new ground. You're not there um, changing the culture of anything. The Night's Watch has just chain, carried on as it was all the way through changelessly. Um, so, uh, yes, there are some good men who have been Lord Commander, but um, none who have really, in, in the way that Barrist and Selmy could be, uh, he can get his plaudits for these legendary deeds of uh, going in and rescuing the king single-handedly um, or f winning tourneys. Or... The Night's Watch didn't do any of that. Uh, they were there to defend the wall. So it's it's actually a slightly different feel. There is glory. Gl well, there is honor there, but not so much glory, if that makes sense. Uh, reflective rambling, picking up a question for Luna. Thank you very much. I love it when people do this. Um, do you think the maesters will play a role in the finale, like in the Doom of Valyria? Have they concerns about dragons again and are plotting? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know whether you're trying to link this across with the Night's Watch or not, um, but do the maesters have a role in this? Yes. Are they plotting? Well, yes, but you have to remember that the maesters, uh, there are rogue maesters who are going to have an important role. Kyburn is one of them. Marwyn the Mage is another one of them. Um, uh, the question is whether the Citadel have got an agenda. Yes, they have an agenda. Uh, they will want the dragons gone when they discover that the dragons are there. Uh, but... Um, the th if you buy into this theory, which I do, uh, that the maesters got rid of the dragons the first time around, how did the maesters get rid of the dragons the first time around? I think it was through poisoning dragon eggs. 
it wasn't I mean we haven't seen how the well, there were four dragons left alive at the end of uh, the dance of the dragons um we haven't seen how they die um but the kind of feeling is that this wasn't the maesters two of them uh well three of them are sort of gone off on their own basically uh, so your and will probably die of old age is the working assumption. Uh, only one of them, mourning, is quite young, and we don't know how mourning will die. But it's um, the maesters were poisoning the dragon eggs. That's how they stopped the dragons from carrying on. They will have kept that memory, I feel sure. Uh, but until uh, well, until this moment in the story, none of Danny's dragons have. Um, laid any eggs, as far as we're aware. Um, Darius Hutchinson, what are your thoughts on the Dane half-hand theory? This is the theory that Corin half-hand is Sir Arthur Dane. Um, I mean, it's kind of like the lack of evidence for this. One, one of the things I find... Uh, I, I don't like to sort of just dismiss theories. Um, uh, I'd I like to give them the time of day, let them try to justify themselves. Um, current half hand is known and has been in the watch um, for a very long time. I think possibly even since birth, people have known him for all that time. Um, so it doesn't quite work timing wise. Um, also, Arthur Dane was one of the most famous people in the Seven Kingdoms. Um, so to put him at the wall was not actually, if you're trying to keep him safe, putting him at the wall is not, yeah, it's not many people go there, but he also went uh, at going up to the wall at that same time were people who definitely would have known. There were several people after Robert's Rebellion, who got sent up to the wall, who would have known what Arthur Dane looked like. That it didn't, it doesn't feel like a safe place to put um, someone like Arthur Dane to me, anyway. Um, and also, I th a lot of this theory seems to be uh, he's there to be protecting John, but the that was never the idea of John going to the wall was never really in Ned's mind. Uh, he had to really think about it when it was suggested to him. Uh, so the idea that this was a long-term plan um, doesn't quite add up. So um, that, that's my basic thinking: is that I don't. It doesn't quite add up for me. Um, then you get into the whole the thing that Ned um, at the Tower of Joy. We we get used to quite a lot of the time with the Tower of Joy saying, "Well, what Ned's recollections? This is just a fever dream." George R. R. Martin has told us. Uh, that we shouldn't take fever dreams literally. Um, but Ned remembers not in his fever dream. He specifically remembers there were seven against three and only two of us uh, lived to walk away uh, or to ride away. Um, the clear implication is that uh, everybody but Ned and Howland Reed died there. We don't know how they died, but the fact they did die there. Now, is this watertight? Is there a way George R. Martin could get around that? Obviously, uh, but uh, to equate those two characters, I think it's it's based more on um, a wanting uh, uh, Arthur Dane not to be dead than actually any evidence to support it in particular. Um, Let's go to, um, oh, well, we're sort of having been talking for a little while. Actually, this is the moment I will just say a couple of quick thank yous. First of all, patrons, thank you so much uh, for your support. This is why I answer my patrons' questions as a priority. If you'd like to support this channel, the best way to do that is via Patreon. There, I think, is probably a link down below. I'm sure one of the moderators will be putting a link wherever your live chat is if you are watching live. And talking of moderators, thank you. Um, you are amazing. Uh, you keep the chat uh, a happy, vibrant, and safe place for people to just be talking about the things that they 
love. So um, if you are in the live chat at the moment, uh, please could you just show a little bit of love for the moderators because they definitely deserve it. Um, Martin S. Uh, it seems on the show as if Maester Aemon Targaryen was slightly on Jon Snow's side against Alistair Thorne. Maybe only slightly. Is that true? And if so, how was his relationship to Alistair? Um, right, so, so Alistair Thorne, um, he's, so he was sent to the wall um, after Robert's rebellion and gained his position, which was basically training the newbies to fight. Um, and he did it with a kind of, bullying way now maester aemon um yeah we don't see huge amounts of interactions um but i i think he could see the potential for in john from very early on um he uh certainly J. more mont saw the potential in john from very early on and uh, i think aemon did as well uh so was he on his side? Yeah, I, I guess a bit. Um, certainly the leadership team as a whole were a lot more easygoing on John than they were on anyone else. John, let's not forget, um, he he was provoked, but he was provoked by a few nasty words from Alistair Thorne. John basically got, his, I think it was his knife out, and just jumped at Alistair Thorne and was basically going to kill him but i think a stupid number of people four five people uh, it took to pull him off um this was john attacking a com one of his commanding officers um and he just kind of got away with it really in the end um so um yes maester aemon was uh he doesn't ever sort of say oh that alistair thorn's horrible but he does seem to be broadly on uh, on John's side. Um, let's go to uh, Andrew K. Actually, saying with John's real name discussed before, I like Aemon. To be honest, obviously the links with Maester Aemon, but he echoes the Dragon Knight quite a big bit as well. Yeah, he does. Yes. Uh, um, uh, what John's real name as a Targaryen is is a source of endless fascination. For me, because I think you can you can make good arguments for four or five different names. Uh, it has to be said. So my my instinct for Aegon is not me saying that this is definitely what it is. It's just that that feels about right to me. But if if it turns out that John's got any other Targaryen name, then I'd be fine. That's okay. That's whatever Lyanna chose, basically. Um. Let's go to uh, Emma Scheiman saying, Hi, Robert. I'd love to hear your thoughts about the Black Gate. Uh, I have several questions here. Um, uh, who built it? How long has it been there? When might it have been used in the past? By whom? What kind of magic powers has it? Is it sentient? Uh, would it work for a watchman who swore his oath in a sept? Um, and Raven's Oath also asking uh, the or saying the description of the talking weirwood under the night fort is different from other carved faces in trees. Not just the fact it spoke and is a person, maybe in a thin sense, or is being controlled by someone or something. The description Sam gives is that of a human face that grew, aged, and is blind. What are your thoughts? Um, so yeah, this is interesting. So uh, when we yeah, this is how in the books Sam um, gets from the north of the wall to the south, and Bran and Co. get from the south of the wall to the north. They go through this, uh, it's called the Black Gate, um, which is hidden down a well a long way deep underground in the Night Fort. So, the first thing is that this implies this is one of the early parts of the Night Fort. The Night Fort, we're told, is ancient, and the oldest bits are underground um over time uh, things have sort of built up and this is what uh, this is what gen generally happens um uh, so that the older bits are underground um and the way this is described is that this is a big weirwood face 
but it's like a human face in Weirwood. And uh, it asks the question, who are you? Uh, Sam recites the middle part of the Night's Watch vow. So that's the bit that we're theorizing is the older part. So again, story checks out on that. And then its mouth opens up like that and they can walk through. So this seems to be some kind of ancient magical door in the night's fort for getting past the wall. Um, who made it? Who knows? But one of the, the early night's watchmen, I think, is the, the probable answer. Um, is it sentient? Um, is it a weirwood? Is it a person? Um, again, we we don't know. We're not given any of the law or background on this. Um, it does look more like a human. I've heard um, people argue very convincingly that this is the equivalent of someone like Blood Raven, who's been caught up in the weirwood network um, and is now just sort of there, stuck in the weirwood tree. Um, I've heard that this other people arguing this this is like some there are some times when um people look at a weirwood tree, the face that's carved into a weirwood tree, and it looks like someone. Um uh, so for example, Theon thinks he hears Bran's voice and he looks and he thinks that the, the tree looks like Bran. Uh, so if you're using the weirwood tree magic, can your does the Face, take on your features in some way that seems to be roughly what's going on here um all of the details are slightly vague one of the things which is interesting is um that on first glance this seems to be quite um quite an easy password <laughs> um if this is the night's watch vow and all you have to do is say um say the vow, and then it lets you through. That seems quite simple. But again, we have to remember that the barrier here is not the actual physical wall. It's not the physical door. It's the magic. Cold hands cannot come through. Even though Cold Hands seems to be a member of the Night's Watch, or was a member of the Night's Watch, um, he cannot come through um, because the magic stops him, because he is Dead. This is part of the way that they realize that he is dead. Um, so the magical barrier stays there. This is just a way through the physical barrier. Um, the question of whether if you swore your oath before, you know, in a, a sept rather than before a weirwood tree is an intriguing one because Sam obviously did it before a weirwood tree. Um, we don't know. It's possible, maybe this magic is that clever that it goes, oh, I recognize you. You're you're reciting the oath, and I can remember I saw you uh recite the oath before. Um we maybe it's that clever, we just haven't seen other people do this. Um but it may be this this whole this whole segment feels like it isn't. Um, but it feels like a sort of an homage by George R. R. Martin to um, the Moria section of um, uh, the Lord of the Rings, um, the the entrance, um, an entrance that you have to get through with a password of types, uh, which is actually really simple password when you think about it. Um, so the echo is that I say it isn't. We've had confirmation. This is one of the, one of the more disappointing things. Uh, a while ago, um, History of Westeros uh, did an interview with George R. R. Martin himself, uh, which was fantastic. The interviews on their um, YouTube channel, if you want to check that out, a lot of really good stuff came out of that. But one thing which um, I, I know Aziz was. Uh, very pleased with had worked on actually we worked we jointly worked on a video on this um was this idea that that chapter was inspired by um the what happened in 
Moria that because the echoes the more you look the more you see um they're going down a well they hear sounds coming up from the well that was Sam coming up from the well um he gets when he arrives he gets stabbed Mira stabs him with a spear um uh and it's okay because he's got armor underneath his clothes which feels again very much like Frodo getting stabbed uh and think people think he's dead but it's okay he's got armor he's got the mithril armor on the echoes are all over the place with that. Uh, but uh, Aziz did ask him, George R. Martin, whether this was some sort of homage there. And George R. Martin basically said, no, nope, not at all. Uh, so that was a bit of a disappointment. But anyway, I'm digressing a little bit here. We have, uh, um, I think, two options here. Option number one is that this is done on a recognition system uh, that Sam could get the door to open because he had his um he swore before the weirwood tree um and it recognized him or secondly this is just if you recite the right thing then it will let you through and that's just it's going to block the things the magic is going to block what needs blocking my instinct is the latter uh for the simple reason that um cold hands was there waiting for um uh, he put the sam and co through um but there's no reason for him to know that sam swore his oath before a weirwood tree um sam probably shouldn't he came from the south he he didn't even follow the old gods uh so uh there's by instinct, I think it's probably that. Um, but I like the thinking. I like the thinking that that perhaps this is some kind of a call and recognition system going on. Uh, Dr. D. Bunk saying, why do you think Mance Raider didn't know about the Black Gate? Um, cold hands knew and the gate is rather magical and memorable. Um, or did Mance simply not know how to open it? Uh, so I, I think the, sh the short answer is that everyone had forgotten about the Black Gate. Um, the the Black Gate. So the um, the Night Fort had been abandoned uh, a long time ago. So the I wish I could remember the exact um, year. Something like the year sixty three is when Alison Targaryen heads up to the Wall and she sees the Night Fort. And basically, the Night Fort is massive. Um, it's huge. Um, it takes takes so much to heat it and maintain it, and there were just not many members of the Night's Watch. And she said, "This this is not the right place. You should just build a smaller, better um, fort uh, and move out of here and into that." And she gave them her jewels. She said, "This is I pay for it," um, and they went, "All right, great." Uh, so that's why they moved out of the Night Fort when that. Um, other deep lake once that had been uh, built which will have been a few years later so something around let's say 70 AD so for something around 230 years the night fort had been abandoned uh, institutional memory of it will have died um, so by the time Mance Raider is uh, he's a member of the night's watch he's not at the night fort he seems to have been based over in the Shadow Tower for most of his time. And uh, uh, so there's no reason that he would know the details of everything about the Night Fort. The Night Fort is just one of many forts that they didn't go to anymore. So that's why he didn't know about it. Nobody knew about it. Jon Snow doesn't seem to know about it. He's Lord Commander. There's there's no hint that Jael Mormont ever really knew about it. Um, who might have known about it? Well, Bloodraven. Um, he he that knows he definitely knows a whole load of uh, the Green Seer magic by this point. Um, he will um, almost certainly have been fascinated by the Night Fort and will have found the Weirwood Tree there as he's caught. He's he's um, he's he's a Green Seer. Uh, so the the fact there isn't Castle Black, there isn't 
weirwood tree. He will have been aware of where the weirwood trees are. Um, I think he found out. And uh, I'm sure somewhere there will have been some notes about uh, this is the state we left night f- the night fort in and who would have access to them. Well, Maester Eamon would have ac- access to them and the Lord Commander would as well. So he knew about it. Um, Cold Hands works for Blood Raven. That's how Cold Hands would find out about it. But there's no reason for someone like Mance Vader to. Uh, Craig the White with your first uh, super chat or super sticker, actually. Thank you very much. I hugely appreciate that. Thank you. Um, didn't see a question attached to uh, that. Um, but oh, you did do uh, you did another one saying, I've been pondering the names of the castles of the wall, perhaps named for the people who garrisoned them, e.g., Green Guard for the reach after Garth. Yeah, it's. Um, so the names of the wall seem to be, um, some of them seem to be named after particular, you know, uh, things like that green guard. It, it might simply be that there's lots of trees there. Uh, most of the names I think are pretty obvious. Um, so you get, uh, East watch is right at the Eastern end of the wall. Um, so Queen's Gate was specifically named after Queen Alison. They renamed a castle after her. Deep Lake is where there is a deep lake. Um, so most of them seem quite obvious. Uh, the the ones which stand out for me are the Shadow Tower and the Night Fort. The Shadow Tower is what is that um, at the that's the western end basically. Is there a reason why? Well, it's right next to a gorge, so perhaps there's lots of shadows going on, maybe. Uh, but is there something else that that's referring to? And the night fort, um, is this a reference to the fact that this was built during the long night? I don't know. Um, so I, I think in answer to your question, I find most of them are quite straightforward. It's only two or three that really um grab my attention um in terms of whether they garrisoned according to where people came from that certainly doesn't seem to be the practice in the current age of the story it's possible maybe they did that um uh, earlier on but one thing that they seem to have been very aware of particularly with these forts is that you didn't want a particular fort to suddenly um, get so much of a sense of its own identity that it would rebel against the rest. And the the most surefire way of that happening is by putting a whole load of people with their own identity in that they feel is different from everyone else's identity. So the, 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 the starting point seems to be everybody arrives at Castle Black and then you're just distributed out according to your skills, not according to where you came from. Uh, J.D. Finity saying, if Ned's plan to give John some land and a keep had come to fruition, and if John, if allowed, had picked a last name, what do you think it could have been? Something like Karstark or Greystark or something more unique? Mm. Uh, so if this is... Um, yeah, so if if the war and all of these things had never happened and... John had sort of grown up. So he was like, he was nearly grown up. Um, and when he decides to go, he was 15. He heads up towards the wall. Um, Ned's vague idea was that he would sort of give him, you know, give him a keep and stuff like that. Could, could John have chosen his own surname? Uh, perhaps. Um, what would he have called himself? I don't know. Um that's an interesting one for the chat, actually. I'll throw that one to the chat if you don't mind. Uh, so, chat, this is an open thing for you. Um, if if none of this had happened, if John uh, had been allowed to sort of just set himself up with a nice home, if he'd been allowed to choose his own surname, if he decides he doesn't wish to be a snow, uh, but uh, Ned sort of recognises him and allows him his own surname, and effectively, therefore, his own house, what do you think he'd choose? Um, 
Uh, Daniel Dibka saying Barstark, which is, or Targ Stark says Man of War. Uh, I, I like them. Uh, keep the ideas coming in. Um, Sir Friend saying, how will we hear about the others getting through or past the wall once John and his new team go south? No new uh, POVs, right? <clears throat> Thanks for the amazing content. Yeah, so no new POV POVs. In the main bulk of the books, George R. Martin has said um, he's not going to be doing any new POVs. Um, does that mean there's no POVs at the wall? No. Um, does that mean we won't see this happen through a POV? No. Um, but let, So let me explain. First of all, one thing that he does do quite a lot is when he wants to tell bits of the story and the POV characters have moved away from there or they aren't there yet, he will create a new POV character for that part of the story. For example, um, Sir Barristan did not have a POV until the, the moment at which, uh, or a bit before, we get Danny disappearing off on the back of uh, Drogon. Um, and he wanted us to know what was happening in Meereen. And so he needed a POV, so we get Sir Barristan. Um, what's happened at the wall is that there were several POVs at the wall that he could have used. There was obviously John, there was Sam, uh, there was also Davos. However, Davos has headed off, uh, Sam has headed off, and John has just died. So what's happened there? Well, he's introduced a new POV. We've only had one chapter from her POV, but I think the implication is that we will get more, which is Melisandre. So um, we will see things through her POV. We also see things through John's um, POV. So we will end up having, uh, for a while, we'll have two POVs in um, at the wall. Um, there are also, uh, one thing that he's not committed to um, is prologues and epilogues. Now, we know that the prologue is almost certainly going to be in the Riverlands, um, but we've got an epilogue, and I, I think that this could work. I'm not saying this is what will happen, but what he tends to do with prologues and epilogues is whoever the character is, whose point of view it is, they die, probably in that chapter itself, uh, or perhaps a little bit later. Um, it, it would be a certainly a, a very striking way to have an, epi uh, an epilogue for Winds of Winter or a prologue for A Dream of Spring of a rando member of the Night's Watch at, you know, watching out from the wall as suddenly seeing the others come closer and then, however, the wall gets destroyed, they breach the wall, whatever it is, and then we see that member of the Night's Watch getting attacked by... Uh, one of the others or something like that. That would be a really striking way of doing it. Um, so, I mean, that's probably how I would do it. The other way is that maybe we just hear of it. Uh, maybe we don't see it. Um, the the horror that he's built up with the others is that we don't see much of them. They're this threat, but we don't see much of them firsthand. How many times have they actually come into contact? We've had the prologue. We've had Sam's interactions. Um, it's large, most of it is off camera. So uh, he might just carry on doing that. Martin S. What was Eddard Stark's brother Benjamin's relationship to the Night's Watch? Uh, what is the first ranger role? Scouting the lands north of the wall. Did Benjamin have exceptional wilderness survival skills? So yeah, Benjamin joined the... Um, Night's Watch, and he worked his way up through his own skills to become First Ranger. Basically, underneath the command structure is you get the Lord Commander, and then you get the three deputies, effectively. You get the First Ranger, the First Steward, and the First Builder. And uh, so they're all based at Castle Black. The role of the First Ranger is to be in charge of the Rangers. Um, and uh, the rangers are there to be scouting north of the wall, to be, um, they have to be good at fighting because they will be potentially fighting wildlings at times. Um, they're, they're there to investigate, they're there to see what's going on. Um, does he have exceptional wilderness survival skills? 
yeah, he does. Um, he has, I can't remember exactly what George R. Martin has said about this, um, but uh, I was researching something completely different the other day um, uh, and saw a quote from him where he said, uh, of the Stark, the three Stark brothers, um, then Brandon Stark was probably the better fighter. Ned was probably the better battle commander or strategist and Benjen had more sneaky tracky skills so uh, he didn't use those words but that was the general feel <clears throat> so yes he was he was very good at it uh Vilma Kanta um hi again thank you for a great stream are there any known Dornish or perhaps associate Night's Watch members is Sam the most distant Night's Watch member that we know of oh in at the moment um this is a tough one to answer. The, the, in my mind, I think there are some Asozi ones. Um, certainly there have been from Dawn. Um, when Nymeria uh, attacked Dawn, basically, and sort of fought all, there were lots of kings in Dawn, and she united it um, and then started the Nymeria Martel um, dynasty. Uh, the kings that she defeated, she sent up to the wall. So there, there have been Dornish people at the wall. There have been Asozi people at the wall. Um, this is known around the world. This is a famous thing. The Night's Watch are known. This isn't just like something that the North knows about. This is uh, um, a wonder of the world. Um Right, we've got a few suggestions about what John might uh, call himself: Snow Stark, White Stark, Tar Stark, Fitz Stark. That, I'm guessing that's a fan of um, uh, the Robin Hobb There, Ice Stark, um, uh, White Stark, John Coldwood, Starkwin, House Ghost Stark. Um, yeah, there's a lot of really good ones going on here. John White Wolf. Um, uh, so, uh, SSS Scene saying, Hi, Robert, what do you think about the idea that it's a bit of a plot hole that John didn't know what the watch really was like? I don't think it's a plot hole. I think it's really good world building um, because clearly Tyrion knows what it's like. Um, but John doesn't. Why doesn't John know what it's like? Uh, because he's grown up in, in one of the few environments where being a member of the Night's Watch is seen as actually a, a noble career to go into. Um, that's clearly what his father, Ned, thought. Um, that's what the Starks had always thought. Um, Benjen had gone up there. There's no hint, although I've speculated in videos about the reasons why Benjen went up there, but there's no hint that the world thought that Benjen went up there other than that this is just what Starks do sometimes. Um, and when he came back, he'd, uh, uh, which he did every now and then, came to Winterfell um, and he saw John and he would tell him stories of what he was doing. And clearly he'd done very well for himself. He'd made his way up to being the second most or equal second most important member of the war on of the night's watch he'd done good um so i think this is not a this is not a plot hole this is actually good world building that uh anywhere else south of around about there that the thought would have been oh the night's watch that's that's just a place full of thieves and criminals um i'm I'm pretty sure that um, had he been, had this thought been there for a long time, that, oh, I want to go off and do this, then Ned would probably have started to tell him a bit more about what it was really like, because Ned will have known what it was really like. But generally speaking, how Stark, very positive. Um A 
let's go to a question from Sir Darius Hutchinson saying, why so few other northern houses at the wall? Now, there's lots of northern uh, houses at the wall, but you'll find it's more of the northern northern ones who care about the wall. So the Mormonts, obviously, you've got Lord Mormont up there. Um, but yeah, lots of lots of the northern northern houses support the wall. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, it's... Um, The, the wall is, um, or they're coming up to winter, uh, I think is the, is the other point I was kind of making. And everybody knows they're coming up to winter. So uh, their thought is not at, about supporting the wall so much as that how do we prepare for this ourselves? Let's go to... Um, uh, question, I think this is... Uh, debunk i can't i didn't actually cut and paste across who this was from uh, this question uh with so many wildlings giants and mammoths wouldn't it have been easier to clear an abandoned pass through uh, a tunnel at an abandoned fort rather than take castle black um it possibly um the manse raiders tactics can leave quite a lot of questions it has to be said um, because you could certainly argue that um, you could get a certain proportion of his group of people around the east coast before anyone could really react. The, the war goes up to the water, and you can uh, sail around there. Plenty of people have sailed around there. Uh, there's a way that you can walk down the gorge on the west of the um, the, the wall and sort of circumvent it. Um, certainly one way that wildlings have got past before is that you send some people climbing up, as you saw John and co climbing up, and then they drop down these really long ladders. Uh, there is a way that you, there are ways there, but um, Mance seemed obsessed by trying to get hold of the horn and to get to um, uh, his way was to, I mean, I don't think he actually wanted to use the horn, but he wanted to threaten to use the horn and get them to let everybody through. He thought that would be the easiest way to do this. Um, might he have gone and tried to go through, uh, get everyone to hack their way through the wall at a, an old fort? Well, firstly, it's probably hard to tell exactly where the fort is. Secondly, um, the Night's Watch do still, they don't do it as much now, but they do still keep an eye. They they go on patrols up and down the wall. Uh, so they would have found them there, um, and uh, they would have been in exactly the same position. The Night's Watch would have just moved along the wall and started attacking them there. Um, so uh, when these, when a, a fort was abandoned, um they and, and the night fort we i think we have to forget the black gate this seems to be an anomaly um normally what they would do was they would block up any gates or entrances and and the wall let's not forget that the wall is um really thick this isn't just like a normal sized wall this this takes you have to ride through there or walk through there it takes a bit of time to get through there it's massively thick um and that was blocked up. So any entrances were there. They put effort into blocking them up. And they probably were, as they will have not just used ice and things like that, but like stones and uh, whatever they can put their hands on. That's probably more secure than just the rest of the wall. Uh, it's, a, it's a fair question. I, I find it hard to defend Mance's overall approach to getting south of the wall. Um, uh, but I think his... The basic thinking has to be, we'll go where we know that there is a way through. Um, uh, Stephen asking about the different kingdoms' uh, relationship uh, to the Night's Watch before Aegon's conquest. Did they contribute to its upkeep, or was it a strictly northern concern? It was pretty much a northern concern. Um, I mean, it may others may have supported them, the, the Night's Watch, but realistically, if you were a random house down in the reach um why would you support the night's watch there's there's no particular it's not even part of your culture because you're you probably an andal house now there's no link across to there you don't think that there's a 
a real risk of the others because you think they're just a myth. You don't think that there's a real risk to you of the wildlings because they're a long, long way north. So why would you support them? Um, let's go to uh, Stephen asking or saying, J.L. Mormont was apparently the 997th Lord Commander and Jon Snow the 998th. Do you think there's any significance to this number being so close to a thousand on the eve of the other's return? Yeah, I do. Um, George R. Martin likes symbolic numbers. We were talking about this a little bit earlier in the stream. Um, so it's not a coincidence. Gerald Marmont is 997. Um, Jon Snow is 998. He will almost certainly, as I've said, um, once he gets past his current local difficulties, he will almost certainly abandon his post and head south to Winterfell, um, at which point he will probably formally hand over um, to another Lord Commander. There, there are, um, uh, well, not just that I died and have come back and therefore have fulfilled my Night's Watch vows. That's one one way of getting out of his Night's Watch vows. Um, but also, uh, he has, uh, at some point, he's going to find out that uh, Rob Stark um, has basically freed him from his vows by making him his heir. Uh, so he's got another way that he's like freed from his Night's Watch vows. Um, so I think he's heading south, and uh, that means there's going to be another Lord Commander, 999. Now, obviously on the show, they I think they made that Ed, did they? Um, uh, that was just because that's the character who there with that. Was there another Night's Watchman left who, uh, after that, I don't think so, that we had knew the name of. Um, so it could be anyone um, in the books, uh, but... The idea that a thousand is the full, the completion number, um, and maybe the thousandth uh, Lord Commander of the Night's Watch is the one to close down the Night's Watch. That would that would work quite well. But yeah, it's not it's not a coincidence. I don't think. Um, uh, Alison uh, also asking about the oath. Sorry, I should have picked this one up at the same time. Um, saying, um, do I? Uh, so the I shall take no wife, hold no lands, father no children, wear no crowns, win no glory, um, seems to be exactly what the Knights King did. Do you think this part of the oath was added after his existence, or do you think he purposefully broke all of those oaths for some reason? I, th I think it was probably after they were added after his uh, his existence. Um, the what he did, the, the story we get is actually quite small. It's actually quite limited. We focus a huge amount for all reasons. Um, but uh, we, we don't get all of his motivations, but his motivations seem not to be, I hate the Night's Watch and I wish to spit in its face. That's not really what it is. It seems to be that he fell in love and got with the corpse queen, uh, the Night's Queen, whoever, whatever she was, and became corrupted through that. That seems to be what it is. Uh, so him deliberately doing those things, no, I but I think that uh, after him or after some other um, Lord Commander um, it tried to get fame and glory and honour for themselves, then uh, those bits were added. That, and when I say some other, that there are various lords commander that we read about who um tried to change the traditions get more glory for themselves uh there is one i forget, I forget the first name but he was a he was a high tower um who decided that he wanted to uh, have his son succeed him as lord commander which was not really the spirit of this because every Lord Commander should be voted on um, and this should not just be something passed down as if it's just another Lordship um, and so he uh, he was kicked out and killed um, as is the way so uh, 
Yes, after probably after the Night's Watch, after the Night's King, or maybe after one of the other ones, that's when that was added. Rassler um, saying, do you think Stone Snake is alive as he continues to be listed as such in the appendices? Could it be his POV we see further north through? And Nick from NJ saying, if any man, this is a quote uh, from um, Corin Halfhand, if any man in the Night's Watch can make it through the Frost Fangs alone and afoot, it is you, brother. Okay, so um, I, I, Stone Snake is, um, is a really interesting character. Uh, and his fate is potentially quite significant. When um, Mormont decided to do the Great Ranging, he called on the Shadow Tower to send a bunch of people, which they did. Um, Corin Halfhand was among that, and Corin he sent with John and a few others to go off whilst uh, Joe Mormont set up camp at the Fist of the First Men. He sent Corin Halfhand, John, uh, um, uh, and a few others headed off to go and try and see whether they could find Mance Raider's army and just sort of see how big it is. Stone Snake was part of that group. And uh, when uh, basically they have to run away, um, they get a problem is that Stone Snake's horse um, gets injured. And so he would then be afoot. And so... Corin says, and, and Stone Snake says, well, I can, they're being hunted down at this point by the wildlings. He says, well, I can wait behind while you carry on. I'll, I'll wait behind and maybe I can slow them down a little bit. Maybe at very least I can take down a few of them um, uh, while you're escaping. And Corin Halfhand says, no, um, just head off on your own on foot. Uh, just try to escape. If anyone can do this, you can do this. He was this wiry man. He was in his 50s. He was a very wiry man. He was a great climber. He had great night sight, we're told. Um, and so he heads off. And a bit later, John gets captured. Um, and he hears the report back from this that says, oh, all but one of that group uh, are accounted for, but one, this is Stone Snake, has escaped. He climbed up a mountain that we could not follow him up. So he's out there somewhere. Um, what's his fate? Well, I think the the fact is that yes, if anyone can survive out there, it's him. So we shouldn't assume one way or the other. But what we can say is that he's been gone a long time now. And if he was so he, he was basically commissioned to go off and find Lord Mormont at the Fist of the First Men. If he's gone there, he will have found that uh, they got attacked by the others and the whites. Um, and what would he do then? Well, your guess is as good as mine. But he's been gone for such a long time that he didn't just go back to Castle Black. That much we can be sure of. He did not head back to Castle Black, which means one of two things, I think. Either he did just get killed. He went to the Fist of the First Men. That's where the others were. That seems the likely thing is he just got killed. The second option is that having seen what happens, he decides to just find out more. Before going back to Castle Black, he wants to discover some more. Um, We've also got Benjen out there, um, who seemingly was carrying on hunting, exploring, looking for what's going on. So we have two Night's Watchmen who perhaps are dead, um, but we know that they're very good at what they do, so perhaps they're alive. Uh, I think at least one of them will make it back uh, to report back to the night's watch so we know a little bit more about what's happening now this um uh question here is that um whether um it, could it be his pov we see further north through 
This is something that Giorgio Martin has said. It was a little while ago, uh, but he has said that in the winds of winter, we will see further north than we have done before, which is a really intriguing thing for him to say, particularly when you add that to the fact that he's not creating any new main POV characters. And the uh, the f- prologue POV character is, he has basically said, going to be in the Riverlands. So how are we going to see this? Um, one option is that we're going to see this through Bran, who's going to be ranging far and wide with his new weirwood powers. Um, another is perhaps through somebody like this coming back to Castle Black or wherever and reporting back. So I think it's possible. I think it's it's unlikely that both him and Benjen are dead. I think because we're told about them, reminded about them, I think that, that we have to at least find out what happened to them. I mean, maybe they met each other. Maybe, maybe um, uh, Stoneskin could, uh, Stone Snake even could um, uh, track Benjen and he finds him and they join up, join forces. Um, let's go to a question from Rasla saying during the long ranging, uh, the night's watch seemed fairly confident that their small party could actually defeat Mance and his wildlings. Do you think if the walkers hadn't attacked the night's watch, uh, they would have been successful in scattering Mance Raider and his army yet. They seem very confident about this in a way that doesn't seem, um, that realistic. Um, this, though, is one of those things where I think we see this with the benefit of hindsight. They hadn't, they hadn't come across Mance Raider before, by this point. Uh, they were, they, the, the Great Ranging had, let's see if I can remember them all, four clear objectives. Uh, the first one was to find out what on earth is going on with all of the, uh, the villages near the wall had been abandoned. What was going on with that? Second one, to figure out what was going on. Where where did Benjen go? What was happening with his group, which had disappeared? The third is dealing with Mance Raider. And the fourth um, was probably to do with the others. Um, but uh, this was not the only objective they had, but they were looking to see what was, uh, what was going on. And they did not know. They'd heard rumours that there was a king beyond the wall, Mance Raider. Um, uh, they'd heard rumours that he was amassing people. They did not know the scale and size of what it was. This was something pretty unprecedented. Because let's not forget, this: what Mance was doing was not just gathering together an army to go raiding the south, which is what the wildlings, king, kings beyond the wall, had generally been doing. He, had, he was trying to evacuate all of the wildlings to south of the wall. He was trying to gather together all of the wildlings. That is something that Gerald Mont would not have considered. So why are they so confident? Probably because they don't think that there's um, uh, that this is going to be as big a group as, as it actually is. Um, could they have taken them? Well, I think they could have, if they'd stayed in a defendable position like the Fist of the First Men. They were all trained warriors, um, whereas Mance Raider, although he had a big army, um, actually he had an ev- even bigger group of people who weren't warriors. Oh, pardon me. Um, so, But that said, the numbers would tell. There were 300 people in the Great Ranging, 300 Night's Watchmen, against and we don't get actual clear numbers but certainly tens of thousands maybe up to a hundred thousand wildlings uh including giants including mammoths including um uh, a whole uh load of wogs and skin changes this is this would not be an even fight um Karis Bellerina, do you think they will, or do you want to see the 79 Sentinels fight against the others? Um, Dead Men of Dunharrow style. Um, 
I don't think they will. Um, uh, I, uh, and do I want them to? I mean, it, it would be quite fun. I mean, I'm basically in, in favour of the end of A Song of Ice and Fire being very high fantasy. It starts out as so low, so low fantasy. Um, book one has a really high fantasy prologue. Here's the others. Here's the uh, ice zombies, basically. Uh, the high fantasy ending with Danny and the dragons being hatched. The, there, there's a chapter there with Bran and all of his dreams. But other than that, book one is incredibly low fantasy. And George R. R. Martin has just, every single book, he's just put it up a notch. He's put it up another notch. He's put it up another notch. There's dragons. The dragons are growing. Uh, we've got not just uh, zombies going north of the wall. We've got other uh, things going on. We've got fire magic happening over here. The, the, he keeps on adding and adding and adding. So my hope is that at the end of this, there's going to be stupid amounts of magic going on. Um, 79 Sentinels, I don't think we've been told enough about them in the story. There's, they're just like a legend. Um, uh, don't think there's enough there to make that happen. It hasn't been teed up enough to actually make it happen, I don't think. Um, but uh, as you know, I, I, want, I want the statues in Winterfell's crypts to come alive. That's what I want um, in terms of uh, crazy things coming to fight against the others. Um, Alhad, will the Night Fort have any significance in upcoming events, or is it more important for its past? Uh, a bit like a shy. George has shown us the talking weirwood gate. It seems like a big Chekhov's gun. Um, so the, the Night Fort, it's, it's, it's probably worth pointing out that the Night Fort has been given now to Stannis. Stannis has said he wants a home base up in the north, um uh john said you can't have the gift um and really there's now too many people to fit into castle black um but he gave him the night fort so he sent john has sent people over to the night fort to try and prepare it for uh, habitation um and so i think we would probably expect to see the Night Fort play a role going forward as the base of Team Stannis. Uh, now, this is going to have to be big speculation, but what happens with Stannis? Is he going to survive the battles that are coming um, for Winterfell? Um, if so, he, we could see him happily um, put a Stark in power in Winterfell, and then him, he goes up to the wall and um i mean is it is it too much to uh to suggest that we were asking who who might be the next lord commander is it too much to say that stannis could just he got frustrated by the uh the fact that the night's watch couldn't pick a leader before if they haven't picked a leader by the time he gets up to the night fort could he just say well i'll lead you then um, you have to follow me. I am the king of the Seven Kingdoms. Um, I, it's not beyond the realms of possibility. And this adds to the fact he's got piercing blue eyes. And so this idea um, that he is being like the anti-Night King, um, I think I, I really like that idea. Will it play a role? Yeah, the fact that we've got a way through the wall is going to be hugely important. No doubt about that at all. Um, Mara Lee, uh, what do you think will be the future of the Night's Watch? Do you think there will always be a need for them at the wall to be the shield that guards the realms of men? Well, what I hope is that um, the, there's a recognition at the end of this story. Now, this isn't all, it's not going to be the kind of story where everybody sort of hugs and holds hands and it's all okay again. Uh, but what, one thing I would hope is that there will be a breaking down of the barrier, literal, figurative as well as literal, uh, of the wall between the northerners and those who are even further north, being the wildlings. I think John has started this by allowing wildlings south of the wall, by creating a new house, the um, Then Karstark House, 
uh, which joins the cast arcs and some wildlings together. Um, so I think this is entirely possible. Um, and if you have got rid of the threat of the others, um, then surely there's no need anymore to be protecting the people south of the wall from the people north of the wall. Um, so my my hope is that there will be no Night's Watch after the end of this story. Um, DM Collins, uh, perhaps going further north than we've seen so far in the previous books means we'll see an actual lair of the others, somewhat like we saw in the show. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, this is this is possible, most possible through, as I say, the, the two options are if Benjamin Say survived, or Stone Snake, but let's go with Benjamin. If Benjamin Say, say survived, and he came into contact with uh, the Whites, he's maybe seen the others, um, he doesn't want to head back to the wall until he knows what's going on. Uh, and so he keeps on going and he sees stuff and then he heads back. That um, could be, and then he tells people. That is one way. The other way is that Bran has already seen the Heart of Winter uh, through Weirwood dreams or through um, uh, Greenseer dreams. He, When he has that um, chapter in a Game of Thrones, book one, he is shown basically Blood Ravens just sort of like showing him stuff about this is the things you can see, and he sort of sees around uh, around the world, sees things that are happening across Westeros, and he goes north, and basically Blood Raven says to him, "This is why this is important," and he sees the heart of winter, and he's scared, so he can go there, um, and. I think it's entirely possible that through Bran's eyes, somehow we will go and see something. And the question is, what will that teach us? What will we be able to learn about the others from this? Because this is the book, this the Winds of Winter is the book where you hope we will discover a little bit more about who they are, what they want. Um, uh, Academia Bartender saying, it's my first time on your live stream. Welcome. Uh, is there any significance in the Rat Cook story that Sam tells? Is it the same in the books? Uh, yes, it's the, is, is there any significance to it? Um, uh, well, on a number of levels. The stories are significant because they're creating an evocative atmosphere in uh, the Night Fort. Um, uh, the Rat Cook is a um, a story basically which is about guest right and a bit about cannibalism. And we've already had this fray pie idea, um, and the importance of cannibalism has been shown through uh, the red uh, through guest right has been shown through uh, the red wedding. And so we will see this echoed in whatever venue. We have that. That I think is probably um, uh, the sort of the uh, the significance of it as as a story. It's not about um, Sam per se, uh, but the other thing. And I've got actually tomorrow. I've got a video coming out about the Jojen paste theory, which has been a theory which has been around the Song of Ice and Fire community for a long time, but I thought I'd just put it down in a video because um, people often ask about it. Um, it's noticeable that in Bran's story, leading up to the point where we get, and if you don't know about Jojo and Paste, have a look at the video tomorrow, you'll learn all about it. Pretty gruesome as a theory, but it's there. But it's noticeable that Bran has his story has got echoes of cannibalism all the way through it right from very early on um uh, there's more than a hint that uh while walked into summer summer eats human flesh he can taste this um the story of the rat cook is one that he thinks about a lot um then we also get um for example, when he's seeing the weirwood visions, he goes back in time and 
Brandon can taste the blood in his mouth from that sacrifice. It's very vague who this Brandon is. Is this Bran? Is he Bran tasting human blood? So this kind of human sacrifice cannibalism thing is a theme for him. And the rat cook is a part of that um, uh, theme going forward. It's not a nice theme, quite a grim one. The the Bran storyline is one of the darker ones that George R. R. Martin has got, it has to be said. Um, Question from um, Corvus Corax saying, greetings from the Great Lakes region of the US. Uh, lake effect snows are in full force. Uh, yes, yeah, stay stay warm. Uh, please do. Uh, it's it's a little bit nippy here, but not anywhere as cold as it is I think, in some other parts of uh, the Northern Hemisphere at the moment in particular. Um, anyway, Tycho Nostoris and John have indebted the Night's Watch to the Iron Bank. If the wall falls and the watch fails, who will the debt shift to? Or will Nostoris never make it back to Bravos? Okay, so um, John, another one of the things, John is very active. Actually, when, when I was sort of like discussing what John has done as, Knight, uh, as, as Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, I think one of the things you have to point out is he does a lot. Um, he doesn't just sit there. He's always making decisions um, uh, and uh, moving on to the next problem. One problem, very practical problem he's got is they haven't got enough food and provisions um, and they've run out of boats. Uh, so Tycho Nostoris, the representative from the bank, is is happens to be passing through. And John says, well, could we have a loan? And so they have a bit of a negotiation and, um, and get drunk while doing it, uh, amusingly. Uh, so um, John... It's all from John's POV, and he re remembers basically. He's saying, you know, at, at the end of it, they were, they were both um, quite drunk, but also a bit miserable with what they'd agreed, which he thought was probably meant that they'd come to a, a reasonable agreement. Um, so he he's getting some money for the Night's Watch, um, which should get them enough food to see themselves through the the winter to come. That's the idea, and. Um, he also wanted to borrow Tycho Nostoris's boat. Um, so they came to an agreement. We don't read all of the details of this agreement, um, uh, but uh, basically John's attitude towards it is, um, if we don't get this money, we'll starve. So it's better to be in debt than to starve. So we'll take on the debt and then we'll worry about it later which is probably a fair, given the fact that the others are heading towards the wall, that's probably a fair assessment, is that let's not worry about tomorrow because, you know, we've got to survive this first uh, and then we'll figure it out. So what the terms are, who might take this up if they don't, I, I think probably Tycho Nostoris would um, uh, think that it was the, whoever sitting on the Iron Throne should take on the Night's Watch debt if they can't um, uh, pay it themselves. Uh, I've got uh, two or three more questions, I think, from my patrons here. Um, so uh, do feel free to drop some more questions in the chat. I will try and pick up as many as, of them as I can. Um, Michelle Aramo saying, Hi, Robert. I hope all is well with you and Dan. It is. Thank you. My question is around the dark stories surrounding the Night Fort specifically we know the story of brave danny flint and the rat cook through the songs written about them but they never really delve much into the much creepier story of the thing that came in the night um of the, the four boys who saw it three died within a year and the fourth went mad when the thing returned years later the four boys were with it following it on chains what do you think was the thing that came in the night Part of me thinks an other. Part of me thinks something supernatural like a ghost, and it's driving me mad. Um, okay. So I will read the story, and um, the story is two sentences long. Um, so uh, firstly, from that, I think we should, we have to uh, immediately say the clues are quite limited. So this is what it is. The Prentice boys all saw it, old man said, but afterward... When they told their Lord Commander, every description had been different. 
and three died within the year, and the fourth went mad, and a hundred years later, when the thing had come again, the apprentice boys were seen shambling along behind it, all in chains. So that's the story. What is the thing? Well, first of all, this is a story, so it may well not be a thing at all. Just because old Nan has a story about it does not make it true. Um, uh, old Nan has stories about all kinds of things. Uh, for example, she tells Sansa that the um, uh, Colossus of Bravos, that's the wrong way of saying it, um, uh, the, the statue of the entrance to Bravos, always have a brain freeze uh, on, uh, on a thing that I should know off the top of my head um, at some point on these uh, live streams. Anyway, um, that comes to life when Bravos is um, uh, threatened and uh, it wades out into the water to defend Bravos um, um, and it uh, eats highborn girls. That's what she says to Titan. Thank you very much, chat, to the Titan of Bravos. Um, and it eats highborn girls, which she said because she knew that that would make Sansa squeal. Uh, she similarly may tried to make Bran react by saying that the Night's King, perhaps he was a Stark, perhaps he was even a Bran Stark, perhaps he even slept in this room once. Uh, she does this. She does stories that she thinks will make the children react. Um, and this is a story that she thinks will make Bran scared. So uh, we shouldn't necessarily take it as this is the truth of a thing that happened. In a literary sense, uh, what this is, um, is that uh, he, we are, George R. R. Martin is using this in this chapter when Bran is thinking, and he thinks about this a few times in this chapter, when he's sitting there and he starts hearing noises from down below. Um, when he's sitting in the night fort and he hears this from the well and they start coming, clumping up the stairs and he's getting more scared and he thinks, this, this is the thing. Uh, that came in the night. Um, it isn't. It's Sam and Gilly. They're they're heading up the stairs, out, um, uh, coming up to meet them. But they don't know that. And this is George R. Martin building up the, from Bran's perspective, the scariness of the situation. Um, is it possibly anything? I mean, uh, when you say a part of you thinks an other, this is a an echo. If we were looking for some sort of explanation, then a sort of an echo or something like that. Um, this idea that this thing is immortal and then can bring the three or four dead boys back, chain, you know, figuratively chained to him, um, um, shambling along. Sounds very much like the descriptions of the, the whites. Um, Caius Bellarina, do you think John repeatedly bringing up Danny Flint is foreshadowing for the death of a woman at the wall? Just the burning of Shireen, or will a woman be assaulted and murdered? A Salise, question mark. Um, well, this actually, I've got a question right here also about that very thing. So I shall combine the two, if that's okay. This is uh, Ares, I think, um, saying, John thinks several times that the wall is no place for a woman, a lesson that is encapsulated by the tragic song of brave Danny Flint, a song about a woman taking on an assumed identity at the wall. In A Dance with Dragons, John believes that Arya is arriving at the wall following a vision described by Melisandre. Um, uh, the reader knows it's not Arya, uh, but presumably could be Jane Poole. Um, but then it turns out, actually, that's Alice Karstark. Um, but John thinks, when he thinks it is Arya, he thinks that the wall is no place for a woman, much less a girl of noble birth. The best solution he could see would mean dispatching her to Eastwatch and asking Cotter Pike to put her on a ship to somewhere across the sea. She could return to Bravos with Tycho Nestoris. Um, and he also thinks about the wall is no place for a woman. Um, uh, another place. Um, now, this... Uh, Aries then goes on to, I, this is a theory that I've heard a few times recently, um, and I did talk about it a little bit uh, before, but I'll happily do, this is a, a fuller version of this one, which is, um, if the fake Arya 
um, Jane Poole arrives at the wall. The wall is no place for a woman. She gets sent with Tycho Nostoris. <coughs> She's traveling with him at the moment, let's not forget, um, to uh, Bravos, which is what John's plan was for her when he thought that the real Arya was coming. She then, uh, she's seen some horrors, Jane Poole. So she goes to the House of Black and White uh, to seek the gift there, the release uh, from life there. And Arya sees her. Um, Arya obviously being based in the House of Black and White. This is just speculation on what might happen. And um, then Arya could could find out about what's been happening by getting this is the, the way that the face changing of the faceless men works that she she gets the face and puts it on her and she experiences some of the memories of that person so she could then um experience the horrors and memories of that um and then head back to Westeros because of this. This is the thing which is she now knows a bit about what's going on and she's going to head back. So um, is Danny Flint the foreshadowing of any of this? <coughs> um, as I mean, I think the main point I'd make here is that Danny Flint is being used by people, specifically John in this case, um, as a way to drive the action uh as always with george R. R. martin it's not just the truth of whether a thing uh, is, is real it's whether people believe it what people do with that if john believes that the wall is no place for a woman that drives his action and he would then send jane Poole um off to with tycon astoris off to bravos um, I think this idea that that Jane Poole meets Arya somehow there works really well. I I think what I've just read out as a possibility that sounds very dark, but very possible. I mean, whether that's what George R. Martin's got in mind, I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, is there going to be a terrible thing happening to somebody at the wall? almost certainly. Shireen will almost certainly be burned at the wall. This is no place for a woman. We've got Selyse and Melisandre both there, both two of the most powerful people at the wall at the moment, which is almost flipping this on its head. To say this is no place for a woman, the women are in charge there now. So I, I think George R. R. Martin is doing a lot of different things here. I think he's not just doing a straightforward, um, here's a story that uh, we've remembered a couple of times about some terrible things that happened to a woman um, who was disguised as a man. Um, I think he's doing a whole load of different layers to use that one tale to show how people react against it. Okay. A Commander Ray... Uh, the others kept quiet for thousands of years, and over the few years prior to the story, and as it begins, they begin targeting rangers and leaders of the Night's Watch. Um, it seems that they are wary of the Night's Watch because assassinating rangers with others instead of whites seems like overkill. Do you think the others fear that the Night's Watch can stop them? Do you think um, it's because they foresaw John, or because um, before the Night's Watch was so powerful, and if they knew how weak the Watch was, they would have moved sooner. Okay. So a few layers to that. Um, the first is what I think is pretty indisputable is that we don't know all of the uh, others' um, plans, but clearly one of their tactics is to attack the um, top level of the Night's Watch, the, the command structure of the Night's Watch. Why do we think that? Well, uh, first of all, we get uh, in the prologue, we get Waymar Royce, who is in charge of that little group, but he looks like he's in charge. He's better dressed um, uh, and better spoken, and they single him out to attack him. Then you get um, the 
first ranger, so one of the ne- one of the top team, uh, gets singled out. Benjamin Stark, his group gets attacked by the Whites. How do we know this? Uh, because some of them return back as those dead uh, bodies that get discovered and brought south in of the wall into Castle Black and then start attacking. Who do they then attack? They target straight away the Lord Commander and also Jeremy Viker, who's also one of the leadership team. All the way through this, they're focusing in on attacking the leadership of the Night's Watch. So this shows us that there's some intelligence uh, to this uh, plan. Um, are they doing that because they uh fearing John or they've foreseen John in some way? This is certainly something uh, Joe Magician, a friend of the channel, he's done videos on this a long time ago, um, which I don't 100% buy into, but I can understand where he's coming from. Uh, the actions of the others seem to be, they seem relieved when they find out that actually there's, uh, Waymar Royce is just fighting with a normal sword. So um, that seems to be the big thing it is uh, there for them. Are they scared of the Night's Watch? Well, if the Night's Watch stories are true, um, what they tell themselves, they pushed back the others the first time around. Um, and they had Dragonglass. They have ways of killing the others. So the, for the others to be wary of them makes absolute sense. We don't know why they were away for so long. Um, but when they do return, when they first come into contact with the Night's Watch, for them to just be just a little bit cautious because they know that these were the guys, the guys wearing black, uh, they were the ones who could get them last time, could kill them last time. Um, so, yes, I would say that they're cautious rather than fearful. Um, last question from my patrons, after which I will pick up any more questions in the chat. Commander Ray saying the wall will stand for as long as the watch stands. Do you think the watch will uh, be what lets the others through the wall? Like how you must invite a vampire into the home, into your home. Um, this is interesting. This is another um, old man saying uh, the monsters cannot pass so long as the wall stands and the men of the night's watch stay true. That's what old man used to say. Now, this has led some people to speculate that uh, when we're looking for how the wall will fall, uh, how the others will get south of the wall, and we are looking for this, um, because on the TV show, yes, they got a dragon to go and burn down the wall, but they made very clear that was them coming up with that. That wasn't from George R. R. Martin they had to think of a way to do this, which seems very clearly to imply that whatever George R. R. Martin had told them, they either didn't think it was going to look cool enough or it was something that they hadn't really included in previous seasons. Therefore, they are not going with it. The Horn of Winter, for example. Uh, they didn't really focus on the Black Gate. All of these things are, uh, are things that they had not really focused on before, so you can understand why they wouldn't. Uh, be uh, wanting to do something as important as the um, the bringing down the wall through them. So anyway, some people have speculated that this is how the others get south of the wall because the Night's Watch have abandoned their task, basically. As Old Man says, um, uh, the monsters cannot pass so long as the wall stands and the men of the Night's Watch stay true. Is that a conditional thing? If the men of the Night's Watch do not stay true, does that mean that the monsters can pass? Are they connected somehow to the magic of the wall? Uh, that the wall, um, as long as the wall stands um, uh, and the men of the Night's Watch stay true, then the monsters, the magic that prevents the monsters moving south, is that there? <clears throat> Possibly. Um, uh, it's... Again, this is just a passing thing from Old Nan, um, but it's another one to add into the list of possible ways that the others might get south of the wall. Uh, are, are the Night's Watch uh, going to abandon their post? It, they may well, 
a large amount of them, almost all of them, go with John down to Winterfell. Uh, they might follow him. But certainly when he comes back, this is going to be a massive event. It's not just going to be like a, oh, I'm back, let's just carry on with what we were doing. People saw him die. They will have seen his body probably put in the ice cells. Um, they will be scared of him. They they will uh, see it. Melisandre will probably acclaim him as some, you know, maybe even as Azora High Reborn if she suddenly sees the light that way. There will be a huge amount of gravitas around what John is. And if John says, right, I'm going south, who's with me? A huge amount of people will probably go with him. So um, does this uh, mean that the Night's Watch are abandoning? Well, he will be abandoning the wall. Does that free up the, um, or get rid of the magic? Possibly. Okay, let's go and chat. Let's go and check in the chat. Um, uh, Andrew K. We're told that the book Knights King controlled the uh, Knights Watch by sorcery. What do you make of that? Human skin changing or form of whiting, etc. Perhaps metaphorical chains like um, the other Night Forge tale. Um, yeah, I mean, he controlled them by sorcery. It is one of these things that, again, the stories, the legends from thousands of years ago, George Martin tells us not to take too literally. Um, to say that he controlled them, the Night's Watch, members of the Night's Watch by sorcery, maybe he was a sorcerer. Maybe he, had, uh, he, maybe he literally just had powers that he could sort of mind control them a bit. Uh, but could he turn them into whites? Well, possibly. Um, but surely if that were the case, you would not say he controlled them by sorcery. You would say that he um, uh, killed them and reanimated them. I don't know. Uh, it's I, I, it's one of those things where I think if you try and dig too much into the detail of it, um, then you kind of lose it. The, 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 the meaning, which is that there was this guy who went over to the side of the others. Um, and uh, he had to be dealt with. That's the, the fundamental um, point here. Um, Steve Ashlerner Turner saying, I did a little checking, and in real life there have been obsidian dragonglass swords that the Aztec and Mayans used. I wonder if this is a forgotten tech of the Night's Watch. Um, uh, yeah, it's so they they were given a hundred every year. The, the children of the forest gave them a hundred dragonglass daggers and they clearly have forgot the dragonglass um, is quite brittle. So it's not really very useful for all that much other than for killing others. Um, Steve Dulmage saying, I finally caught a live stream. Um, love your content of the night's watch. Welcome to you. Uh, great to see you. DM Collins, does it count as leaving your post as Night's Watchman if your commander tells you to go south? Certainly small bands of crows are sent south to get recruits or even abroad or to the Citadel. Yeah, well, it's an interesting question, but obviously after John comes back, is he even in the Night's Watch anymore? Um, it, are his vows and his oath fulfilled because he did serve until the day of his death? Um, will he have got a message... Um, that Rob uh, legitimized him and uh, made him his heir, in which case he freed him from his Night's Watch vows. Um, so John t saying, I'm going south, who's with me, would not be an order from the Night's Watch Lord Commander because he would no longer be a member of the Night's Watch. Um Uh, Greet Weirwood, the pink letter says that there's an attack on the wall coming from the south. Do they do they just wait until it arrives to deal with it and not band together? Now, John John has got a uh, anger management issue. He's charging south. I think that's it. Um, Cars Ballerina say, does it count as remaining true? This is this feels <laughs> feels like a um, uh, quite a meme. Does it count as remaining true to the Night's Watch oath if? You've already killed two Lord Commanders in a row. I don't think they even need to follow John at this point. 
Um, yeah, you could also definitely argue, uh, although the Night's Watch killed the Lord Command John Snow as Lord Commander in order or because they felt that he was going against the Night's Watch. They they think that they, and this is the thing we, we have to get our heads around, I think. The people who killed John Snow think that they are the ones sticking to the Night's Watch oath. They think they're the good guys. Um, they think that John is abandoning his post, and that's why they're killing him, because that's what you do with the deserters. Um, are there any, Sebastian Holden, are there any parallels that you can notice between Targaryens and the Night's Watch, i.e. all wear, wear all black armour, burning their dead, having a separate culture from the rest of Westeros? Um, any... No, not specifically. I think it's so. Um, uh, Targaryens and the Night's Watch. I mean, the the Night's Watch are. Uh, you you can draw parallels with the Kingsguard. You can draw parallels, I think, with the Maesters, um, uh, who they make very similar oaths in those places, um, but not with the Targaryens specifically. Um, Carl Karsnark saying many Polynesian cultures have similar obsidian saw blade knives. Some even used shark teeth. Um, Weirwood saying they will probably make Bowen Marsh Lord Commander while John lies dead. I mean, he's the most obvious. Uh, he's the first steward. Uh, so he's the basically sort of second in command, really, anyway. Um, uh, which kind of makes sense, which would make him 999. Um, uh, and a Greek word would saying the Kingsguard vows were based on the Night's Watch vows. Yes, definitely. Um, let's uh, quickly, I think what I'll do, I think I'll start drawing that one uh, now to a close and tell you about what's coming up tomorrow. I've already said I've got a Jojen Paste video coming out. If you don't know about Jojen Paste as a, as a theory, um, uh, it's a fascinating one. If you are, um, I said this at the top of the stream, but uh, if you've got this far uh, through uh, the video, um, could you just leave me a comment down about the audio quality? I was aware last week it wasn't very good. I've got myself a new um, setup going on here. I think is a bit better. Um, but if you could let me know, that would be fantastic. Um, next week, uh, let's do let's do a Lord of the Rings. We've not done a Lord of the Rings one for uh, for a while, so we'll do a Lord of the Rings live stream next week. Uh, but we also have coming forward here on IDG Live, uh, Aziz will be on. We're going to be talking about a Storm of Swords, and then we're going to be moving this series. Uh, we've been looking all across the north, and next we're going to be looking. The Riverlands. Let's do the Riverlands next. And so we let's start with House Bracken. So that will probably be in a couple of weeks' time. We'll do uh, House Bracken. Um, also coming up, the shorts, uh, the short form uh, content videos will be making a return back on this channel in a matter of a few days or a couple of weeks or something like that, um, as well as other exciting things. I've already talked about the um, hinted at the sort of the video game law playthroughs um, that I've uh, got planned for you. So that's all for this time. Um, uh, thank you to uh, my patrons, as always. Thank you to moderators uh, for another epic length uh, and fantastic bit of work from you. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, take care. Oh, actually, I know I should point at things. Appearing Hereish will be a link to other live streams. Uh, appearing Hereish is going to be a link to the Patreon. Uh, but with that, I shall say, uh, take care, everyone. Uh, stay warm if you're in cold climes this week. It seems a very cold week for a lot of people. Uh, take care, and I will see you next week, same time.